Okay, we're back on the record this morning on case CR 22-21-1624, State v. Lori Noreen Vallow. This is the time scheduled for continuing jury trial. The state's in its case in chief when we broke yesterday. I'll note that the prosecution is here present. The defense and defendant also are in attendance. This proceeding is being held here in this courtroom, of course, subject to a conduct order that prohibits the use of any electronic devices from recording or photographing any images or transmitting them from the courtroom. In addition, in the locations where this trial is being simulcast in both Ada and Madison counties, the administrative order also prevents the use of devices for that reason as well, so they're not permitted to be used to record or photograph or transmit any sounds from the trial and the proceedings. So the court appreciates everyone complying with those courtroom orders. The court's also been advised the jurors are all here and have signed their affirmations, and so I understand the state would have another witness to call at this time. Is the state going to be prepared with the next witness? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Why don't we have the jury brought in then, and then you can call your next witness. All right, thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. All right.
slide is mentioned by the bailiff. The court would note all the jurors are here in attendance, properly seated, and they've also filled out their affirmations for the day. I appreciate you being able to do that and continuing to follow the court's admonition. I'd ask the state at this time to call their next witness. The state calls Ray Hermosillo. All right, sir, if you'd come forward and just pause in the middle of the gallery here, I'll have you placed under oath. You solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. All right. All right, thank you, officer. While you're being questioned, please remember we're keeping a record, so make verbal responses and try to avoid talking at the same time as anyone questioning you. With that in mind, Mr. Wood, you can inquire. Thank you. Can you state your name for the record and then spell your last name? Ray Hermosillo, H-E-R-M-O-S-I-L-L-O. Thank you. What is your occupation? I'm a detective with the Rexburg Police Department. Is detective your rank? It is. Okay. Are you post-certified? I am. I have 22 years in law enforcement and 2,100 hours of training through post and currently hold an advanced certificate through the Post Academy. Okay. How long have you been a detective? Oh, four years now. Okay. And what other responsibilities have you held before you were a detective? I was a patrolman and a patrol supervisor. Okay. Have you worked for any law enforcement agency other than the Rexburg Police Department? No, sir. Okay. And you may have said this already. I apologize. How long have you been with the Rexburg Police Department? 22 years. Okay. Have you been involved in the investigation regarding J.J. Vallow, Tylee Ryan, and Tammy Daybell? I have. Okay. How did you become involved in that investigation? On November 1st, I was contacted initially by Fremont County. I was advised that there was a Jeep in our jurisdiction that was possibly involved in an attempted homicide. And at that time, I contacted Gilbert Police to inquire what they needed us to do in reference to that. Okay. And what did you do in response to your conversation with Gilbert Police? Once I obtained some information from Gilbert, they asked us to seize the Jeep if we had located it. They also asked us to perform intermittent surveillance on the residents. And so at that time, that's exactly what we did. We performed intermittent surveillance until we located the Jeep. Okay. Can you describe what you saw during your intermittent surveillance? We had taken some photographs of Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow walking into the residence, but we were unable to locate the Jeep at that time. When you say residence, where are you referring to? 565 Pioneer, number 175. Okay. During your surveillance, did you ever see a teenage girl with Lori Vallow? No, we did not. During your surveillance, did you ever see a young boy with Lori Vallow? No, we did not. Okay. At the time you were doing the surveillance, were you aware of who J.J. Vallow was? Not at the time during the surveillance, no. Okay. Were you aware of who Tylee Ryan was? No. So is it fair to say at that time you weren't looking for children? That's correct. Okay. Detective, when was the first time you heard of J.J. Vallow? 
Gilbert police uh, came down to Rexburg. Let me back up. We were able to seize the Jeep on November 4th from that residence. Um, at that time, Gilbert police was advised and they came up to Rexburg on November 18th, 2019. At that time, they came up to serve a warrant on the infotainment center inside of that Jeep for GPS locations and things like that. When they came up, that's the first time we heard of Tylee Ryan or J.J. Ballo. So November 18th, 2019. Okay. And at that time, were you told that they were missing? We weren't told they were missing. We were told that their grandmother, uh, Kay Woodcock, was concerned that she hadn't spoken with J.J. for a while. Um, and they just asked us to keep an eye out at the residence. They said they were going to do some checking down in Arizona to see if J.J. was possibly with friends down there. And if they needed us further, they would get with us at a later date. Okay. Did they get with you at a later date? They did. When was that? November 25th, <clears throat> 2019. I received a call from Detective Ryan Piller. Ryan advised that they were unable to locate JJ in Arizona and that he was in contact with JJ's grandma and she wanted a welfare check. So at that point, we told Detective Pillar we would do a welfare check the next morning. Okay. And you said that was November 25th, correct? Correct. So what did you do in response to that request from Detective Pillar? The next morning, November 26th, 2019, myself and Detective Dave Hope went to 565 Pioneer, 175, which was Lori Bellow's residence. Um, as we pulled up behind the residence, there's a garage area on the west side. Outside the garage area, we had located Alex Cox and Chad Daybell, who were unloading a pickup truck. Okay. Did you speak with Alex Cox or Chad Daybell that day? We did. Uh, how did that conversation go? I walked up to Alex, and I asked Alex if Lori was home. Uh, he told me she wasn't home. I then asked Alex if he knew where JJ was at. We were there to do a welfare check on JJ. Um, at that point, Alex got a blank look on his face, kind of a, a frightened look, looked over at Chad Daybell, who was on the other side of the pickup truck. Chad then looked at Alex, um, and they both kind of just looked at each other and, and didn't answer my question initially. Okay. Uh, what did you think about that conduct? Uh, it raised some red flags just based on their the way they acted with that question. Um, I, I then again asked Alex if he knew where J.J. was at, and he stated that J.J. was with Kay in Louisiana. What did you think of that response? I told Alex that wasn't likely because Kay was the one who called in for the welfare check. Um, and then again, they both kind of just looked at each other, which again raised our suspicions. Did you speak with Chad Daybell at that time? I personally didn't speak to Chad at that time, no. Okay. What did you do next? I asked Alex if there was a way I can get a hold of Lori. Uh, he stated she wasn't home. I asked Alex where I could find Lori, and he stated that she was in apartment 107 in the same complex, just a different apartment. That time I asked Alex if he had Lori's phone number, and he stated he didn't have it. What did you think when he stated he didn't have her phone number? I assumed he was lying because they were close. And based on our investigation thus far with Gilbert 
we knew they were close. Um, so I assumed he was lying to me about the not having his sister's phone number. Okay. What did you do next? At that time, myself and Detective Dave Hope went back to apartment 107 in hopes to make contact with Lori. Uh, we knocked on the door at 107, and there was no answer. So you weren't able to make contact with anyone there? Correct. Okay. What happened after that? <clears throat> Once we weren't able to make contact, Detective Hope began knocking on apartment doors next to 107. Um, I started walking back to my car because I was going to call for more people to come to our location and start knocking on doors. Um, and at that time, when I was walking back to my car, I saw Chad Daybell driving towards me in his black Chevy Equinox. Um, so he had just left 175 and was headed our direction. And at that time, I stopped him in the alleyway. And did you speak with him? I did. What did you ask him? I asked Chad when was the last time he saw JJ. And Chad told me it was in October in apartment 107 with Lori Vallow. Okay. Did you ask him anything else? I did. I asked him how he knew Lori Vallow, and he stated that he hardly met her, hardly knew her, that he had only met her a couple of times. Okay. Uh, what did you think about that response? Sustain. <clears throat> okay. Was there anything suspicious to you about that response? There was. What was that? We knew that Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell had been married two weeks prior to my contact with him. Okay. But he said he hardly knew her. That's correct. Okay. Uh, did you ask Chad Daybell anything else? I did. I asked Chad for her phone number. Um, and he stated that he didn't know what it was. Okay. What happened after that? While I was speaking with Chad Daybell, uh, Detective Hope saw me talking with him, stopped knocking on doors, and started back to where I was talking with him. As Detective Hope showed up, uh, I again asked Chad Daybell for Lori's phone number because I didn't believe that he did not know it. Um, and at that time, he finally gave me Lori's phone number. Did he give you a reason why he hadn't given it originally? He said that he felt like I was accusing him of something, and that's why he didn't give it to me. Okay. What did you do at this point in your investigation? I broke contact with Mr. Daybell. He was able to drive off, um, and at that point I called Lieutenant Ron Ball and and I told him that there was something going on with the whereabouts of J.J. Based on the deception, their, the way they, they looked at each other, their non-evasive answers, their lies, um, I felt there was something more going on. So I called Lieutenant Ball and had him grab a few detectives and come over to our location so we can figure out what was going on. Okay. Uh, and did Lieutenant Ball show up? He did. What did you do after that? He showed up with Detective Dave Stubbs, and at that time we went and locked, knocked on uh, apartment 175, which was Lori Vallow's residence. Okay. Did anyone answer? No, they didn't. What did you do next? We knocked on apartment 174 uh, because through our investigation we knew that her niece, Melanie Boudreaux, lived right next to her. And we didn't get an answer there either. Okay. What did you do after that? <clears throat> At that time, Lieutenant Ball instructed me to go to the prosecutor's office to obtain a search warrant for those residents while they stayed on scene to try to get a hold of Lori, Alex, or even Melanie Boudreaux. Why did you feel the need to get a warrant? At that time, we felt that 
there was something more going on with the whereabouts of JJ. And we weren't getting any cooperation from uh, Chad Daybell or Alex Cox at that time. Okay. Did you get a warrant that day? We did not. How come? On our way to the prosecutor's office, uh, Detective Hope, with the phone number that Chad provided, uh, called Lori, left her a message. She didn't answer her phone. Uh, and once we were at the prosecutor's office, Lori Vallow then returned the phone call from Detective Hope, and Detective Hope spoke with her on the phone. Okay. Uh, do you know what happened after that? He was able to convince Lori to open the door. She stated she was home, and there were detectives outside that wanted to speak with her. Are you aware if Detective Ball and Stubbs spoke with Lori Vallow that day? They did. Do you know if they had a a body cam recording that conversation? They did. Have you seen that body cam? Yes, I have. Okay. Uh, Based on your collective investigation, what did you learn I learned that Lori Vallow had told Detective Hope. Correction. Objection, Your Honor. He's, he's going to go into hearsay evidence <coughs> saying what Detective well, I Hope think there told needs her. to be some additional foundation in what he's going on. I didn't see a hearsay coming, but it seemed like a foundation issue to me. Okay. So, Detective Hermosillo, I asked if you were aware if there was a body cam uh, recording of that conversation. There was. And did you watch that body cam? I did. Did you speak uh, with Detective Ball and Stubbs about their encounter with Lori Vallow? Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, Is that a normal part of an investigation to meet with other officers who are working the case? Absolutely. Okay. And is that something you regularly do in the course of an investigation? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, based on your conversation and your, the video, was there, what did you learn? Lori Ballow told the detectives. Objection, Your Honor. This is hearsay. Because he's learning it from, well, I guess I'm not going to do a speaking objection, but if we want to okay. do a sidebar, I can. I'm going to overrule that at this point. I haven't heard hearsay come out. Um, you can answer the question, officer. Your Honor, if I could, would the court allow me to elaborate a little bit? If you'd like to uh, you know, have additional voir dire on your objection, you can do that. Okay. Well, I don't have any additional voir dire. I, okay. Uh, Detective Hermosillo, are you basing your testimony on what somebody else, what you saw somebody else uh, converse with, with the other detectives or the other officers? I'm basing my testimony off what I saw on the video. Okay. Judge, it's hearsay. It's somebody else speaking, and he's speaking for that person. Let me have a brief sidebar with counsel. All right, the court had under advisement an objection made by the defense that the uh, question was eliciting an improper hearsay response. I am going to sustain that objection, so I'd ask you to ask a different question this time, Mr. Wood. Thank you. Detective uh, Hermosillo, you you did testify that you did watch body cam. That's correct. Okay. Uh, Based on what you saw, what were your, in that, what next steps did you take in your investigation? I contacted uh, Detective Pillar with the Gilbert Police Department because we were unable to locate or uh, substantiate where JJ was at that time. Um, It was late evening and we still hadn't heard where JJ was at that time. At that time, I had Detective Ryan Pillar get a hold of Melanie Gibb uh, to see if J.J. was with Melanie Gibb. 
and he was not with Melanie Gibb. So you were you were not that evening able to substantiate the location of JJ Vallow. That's correct. Okay. What did you do? Uh, what was the next step in your investigation? The next step was the next morning, November twenty seventh, twenty nineteen. We met at the prosecutor's office and obtained a search warrant for apartment 175, 174, and 107. And what was the address of those locations again? 565 Pioneer, Rock Creek, Townhomes. Okay. Were you able to obtain those search warrants? Yes, we were. And did you search those apartments? We did. Okay, can you walk us through that? Which apartment did you search first? We started with 175 first, which was Lori Vallow's apartment. Um, when we initially went into apartment 175, uh, they had to break down the front door, uh, which was included in the search warrant. We went into apartment 175. There were uh, couches, dishes in the sink, uh, food in the pantry, food in the refrigerator. Um, upstairs there were beds, uh, toiletries, everything that looked like someone had lived there except for there were no clothes on the hangers. There were just empty hangers in all the closets. Um, and so that caught our attention as well. Did you, were, were any people in there when you entered? There was nobody in apartment 175, 174, and, and 107 was completely vacant. Okay. So you didn't locate JJ in apartment 175? No. Okay. Did you uh, find any evidence that JJ had been there? Yes, there were some there were some toys on the front step, little appeared to be little boy scooters, toys. Uh, there was a, a little boy suitcase uh, under the stairwell in apartment 175. Um, there was also a, an older prescription prescribed to JJ Vallow of Respiradone that we located. Um, but aside from that, there was there was nothing else. Okay. Um, was there anything else of interest that you found in apartment 175? <clears throat> there were uh, several guns. Uh, in the garage of 175, uh, several different army type knives. Objection, uh, relevance, Your Honor. Overruled. Um, several different empty magazines for for various weapons. Um, so there were there were things of that nature in the garage that caught our eye. Okay. Did you search any other buildings that, well, that was in apartment 175, correct? Correct. And then you searched apartment 174? Correct. And who did apartment 174 belong to? Melanie Boudreau, who is Lori's niece. And did you find JJ there? No. Were any individuals present when you searched that apartment? There was not. Okay. And you may have already stated this. I'm sorry. Did you search apartment 107? We did. What did you find in apartment 107? It was completely vacant. Okay. Did you search any other buildings that day? We did. In apartment 175 in the master bedroom, uh, there was a rental agreement for a storage unit in Rexburg. Uh, and on that rental agreement had Lori Ryan as the tenant of the storage unit um, with the 
storage unit number being C52. Um, it gave the address self-storage on Airport Road in Rexburg. Um, so based on that information, we were able to obtain another search warrant for the storage unit. Okay, and what did you find there? In the storage unit, there were some children's bikes, uh, some winter clothing. Uh, there was a personalized blanket with photographs of J.J. and Ty Lee, Colby Ryan, uh, the defendant, Miss Vallow, uh, just family photographs that they kind of had sewn onto a blanket. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the witness be handed what's been marked as State's Exhibit 7A through 7K. The court has a copy. The court has a copy already. You have the originals. <clears throat> I will switch you. I think I have the originals and those are copies, I'm told by the clerks. Detective, can you take a minute and look through what's been marked as 7A through 7K and let me know when you're, you're finished. Are you familiar with State's Exhibit 7A through K? Yes, I am. Uh, what do those exhibits purport to be? Photographs of the exterior and interior of apartment 175. Okay. Were you there when those photos were taken? I was. Okay. Uh, are those photos true and accurate representations of what you witnessed in on the outside and inside of that apartment that day? Yes, they are. Uh, Your Honor, the state would move for the admission of State's Exhibit 7A through K into evidence. Any objection? May I have your aid? You may. So, Detective Hermosillo, uh, you indicate that these photographs were taken uh, during a search warrant? That's correct. And that search warrant was obtained on what date? November 27th, 2019. Okay. And that was, uh, what were you looking for? J.J. Vallow. Okay. And you believe that a crime was committed and that's why you busted down the door? Objection but relevance. Uh, we're outside of the scope of <clears throat> the foundation. If there's an objection for these photographs, how does it relate, Mr. Thomas? I'm going to object to photograph. Uh, Number 7J, as I believe it's inflammatory and doesn't have any, uh, not within the scope of what they were looking for. Other than that, I won't object to any of the others. Okay. 
courts reviewed the photograph of 7J. Um, officer, were those items there when the warrant was uh, served? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. The objections overruled, and the photographs 7A through 7K are all admitted into evidence at this time. Can you describe what's in State's Exhibit 7A? That is the front door of apartment 175 facing westbound. Okay. And is that the apartment, to your, to your knowledge and investigation, that Lori Vallow was living in? That's correct. Okay. And is that the door you knocked on that morning? Yes, sir. Your Honor, I apologize. I didn't ask if I could publish these to the jury. Okay, they can be published. They're admitted. Detective, can you describe what's in State's Exhibit 7B? That is the front room of apartment 175, uh, standing at the front door entry, looking towards the living room and the dining area. Okay. Can you describe what's in State's Exhibit 7C? That's also the front room, uh, standing in the dining area, looking towards the front door and the stairwell going upstairs. Can you describe what's in State's Exhibit 7D? So the photograph just before, there's a white little uh, door. If you'll give us just a moment, Council, we're going to dim the lights a little bit. So Thank you. Can be seen there. Thank you. <clears throat> can you put the, the previous photograph back on? Perfect. So just below the TV on the stairwell, there's a white little door that is a crawl space that goes under the stairs. Uh, the next photograph with the Star Wars suitcase, uh, that's where we located the Star Wars suitcase. Uh, there was also three or four or five preparedness bags with emergency kits uh, under the stairwell, and that's what the black and green bag is there next to the Star Wars suitcase. Okay. When you say a preparedness bag, what was in it? Oh, there was water, flares, uh, I believe there were MRE food, um, just like a 72-hour kit is the best way to describe it. Okay. Can you describe State's Exhibit 7E? That is a photograph standing at the top of the stairwell, uh, looking down towards the bottom floor. In States Exhibit 7F. <clears throat> this is a photograph of the master bedroom. Uh, the doorway to the right uh, leads down the hallway to two separate bedrooms. The doorway to the left is a doorway into the master bathroom and towards the closet area. Detective, I'm going to skip ahead to State's Exhibit 7H. Can you describe that, what, what you observed there? <laughs> this is the master bedroom closet. This is what caught our attention. All the blank 
empty hangers hanging in the closet. There are no clothes. There's there's a towel hanging on the back door, but there are no clothes. Normally when people go on trips and plan to come home, they don't take all their belongings out of their closet. There's still some items that usually remain. And this caught our attention because there was nothing in that closet other than empty hangers. Can you describe what's in State's Exhibit 7I and where that was located? This was a bedroom off the hallway to the north side. Uh, there were some of Alex Cox's belongings found in this bedroom. Okay. How did you know they were Alex Cox's? Um, it had his name on some of the items in a plastic tub in, in the closet. Okay. Can you describe what's in State's Exhibit 7J? That is also an Alex Cox room. Uh, there was a couple Tyvek suits that were also in the closet. Um, there's the plastic tub that, that I just described earlier that had uh, some of Alex's belongings inside that tub in the closet. Okay. Detective, can you describe what's been marked as State's Exhibit 7G? <coughs> <clears throat> That's the rental agreement we located in Lori Vallow's master bedroom on the printer. Uh, it has Lori Vallow, correction, Lori Ryan on the left side is the tenant or the owner of that storage. Um, it also gives a phone number. What is that phone number? I, I can't see it from... Is there a way to zoom in on this? Hand the exhibit to the witness if he can. That's not very clear. Can you hand the witness? Thank you, sir. You want the phone number? Yes, what is that phone number? Four eight zero six nine two nine five six two. Yes, ma'am. And you stated that uh, the uh, the contract was with a Lori Ryan. That's correct. Through your investigation, are you aware if Lori Vallow's name was ever Lori Ryan? Yes, it was. Uh, how do you know that? Uh, through our investigation, we learned she was married to Joe Ryan. And was that before she was married to Charles Vallow? That's correct. Okay, thank you. One moment, Your Honor. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the witness be handed what's been marked as State's Exhibit 8A through Q. Mr. I believe I have the originals here from the clerk, so sorry to confuse, but we'll swap those copies. Your Honor, that the originals, I, I realize there's a sticker on both, but the originals were the ones handed to the detective, and that's the court's copy that the court has. Okay, thanks for clarifying that, Mr. Wood, then. Detective, can you look through State's Exhibit A through Q, and let me know when you're done.
Good. Are you familiar with State's Exhibit A through Q? Yes, I am. Uh, what does what do those exhibits purport to be? These are items that were found in the garage of apartment 175. Okay. Are are they photographs of those items? They are photographs. And is this the same garage that you testified to searching earlier? Yes, it is. Uh, in Exhibits 8A through Q, are those true and accurate representations of what you witnessed in that garage that day? Yes, they are. Your Honor, I'd ask the State's Exhibits A through Q be entered into evidence. Any objection? If I may, voir dire, Judge. You may. Thank you. Um, exhibit A, is that how you've, th these, these photographs are staged, so to speak. I mean, these, this is not how you found the garage, correct? Correct. Okay. And so were you involved in, and that's A through D are the ones that are in the garage, right? All of them are in the garage except for 8E and 8F. Everything else was photographed inside the garage. Okay. So E and F were not in the garage, correct? That photograph of 8E? Yes. Was not taken in the garage. That's correct. And 8F was not taken in the garage. That's correct. Okay. Um, and as I indicated earlier, these, these photographs were staged. They weren't just, this is not how you found the stuff, right? No, we, they were in uh, tubs and bags, and we emptied those tubs and bags out to get a better photograph of what was inside of them. Okay. I have no objection to the to the admission of these photographs. Okay. Exhibits A eight A through Q are all admitted, and they can be published. <laughs> Thank you. Detective, can you describe? what you found in State's Exhibit 8A. Again, this is the garage of 175. There were some tubs, you can see in the background, the black tub and the plastic tub that contain these items. They were taken out of the tubs and laid out. Uh, what this photograph of is a picture of a ghillie suit, uh, several... I'm going to stop you. Can you describe what a ghillie suit is? A ghillie suit is something that you wear if, if you want to camouflage yourself. If you're laying out in a field, you put that over the top of you to blend in with the brush or whatever the environment is. Okay, thank you. Mr. Wood, could we get a spelling on that for the record? If the detective knows. <laughs> uh, I don't. <laughs> okay. Your Honor, I believe it's G-H-I-L-L-I, -L -L -I, but I could be incorrect. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Go ahead, Detective. <clears throat> uh, several different magazines um, used to hold ammunition, different caliber of guns. Uh, there's also two suppressors or, or silencers. Uh, that you use to put on the end of a gun to keep it quiet when it's fired. Um, so that's what is laid out on the ground there. Okay, thank you. Can you describe what was found in State's Exhibit 8B? There were a couple black trash bags you can see in the photograph. Uh, they were full of clothing, 
uh, some miscellaneous papers inside the bags. So we lit, we emptied the bags out and laid out the clothing uh, on the garage floor and took a photograph of it. Can you describe what you found in 8C? This was also in a tub. Um, several rounds of ammunition, different uh, caliber of weapons, uh, just uh, a lot of ammunition in, in that specific tub. You describe 8D, what you found in 8D. 8D was a rifle uh, that we had found on the garage floor or in the garage. Um, the thing that caught our eye with the rifle was the end of the rifle is threaded for a silencer or a suppressor. Uh, so that was also photographed. And this... This may seem like a silly question, but when you say the end of the rifle, uh, what portion of the rifle are you talking about? The barrel. Okay. What were you observing in State's Exhibit 8E? So the black rifle was the same one from the previous photograph, just taken, laid down at the police department on a table. There was also uh, another rifle inside of that bag, um, and that's the rifle you see above the black rifle. Okay. It states Exhibit 8F. That was the other rifle inside of that bag. Can you describe what you see in State's Exhibit 8G or what you observed? Those were the two silencers or suppressors that we had located inside the garage. Okay. What did you observe in State's Exhibit 8H? Those were uh, knives that were also located uh, in the vicinity of the rifles as well. Okay. <clears throat> State's Exhibit 8I. That was also a handgun loaded inside the, located inside the garage, um, in a tub just off to the right of where it's sitting. What did you observe in State's Exhibit 8J? That was a, a, a Halloween mask, it looks like. Um, that was kind of on top of a plastic bag, a plastic Walmart bag that's in the next photo. What did you observe in State's Exhibit 8K? So the, the Halloween mask was on top of this bag, and it had rope and duct tape inside that bag. What did you observe in State's Exhibit 8L? That is Alex Cox passport. That was located inside the garage. Okay. Was that passport still active to your knowledge? It was. Okay. What did you observe in State's Exhibit 8M? <clears throat> so these were documents. Uh, that we had located amongst uh, the defendant Vallow's belongings or what we assumed were her belongings inside the garage. Um, okay. 
Were any of those documents an email? They were it. They were emailed from in the upper left corner. <clears throat> Excuse me. Emailed from Chad Daybell. Eight and what did you observe? <clears throat> Those are some more of the documents from Chad Daybell. Is it fair to say that these documents were laid out and then pictures taken, subsequent pictures t taken in a row? Correct. They weren't found that way. Yeah. States Exhibit Eight O. More of the same document. What what did you find on States Exhibit 8P? Those books were with the documents in the garage that were appeared to be written by Chad Daybell. Okay. And finally, States Exhibit 8Q. That was a cell phone that was also located in the garage. Eight P. testified of <clears throat> the search of this apartment and the garage. Uh, what was the next step in your investigation? The next step, uh, we contacted the FBI. Um, we were just trying to get a hold of of the defendant Vallow and Chad we were trying to locate the children um, in speaking with family members we spoke with uh, Colby Ryan who was Lori's son uh, and at that time he also stated that he hadn't spoken with his sister for a while um, and so our search of JJ also started to encompass Tylee Ryan as well. Did you ever try to contact Chad Daybell or Lori Vallow? We did several times, but their phones were shut off. Okay. At this time, were you aware of their location? Not at that time, no. Okay. And, and just to clarify, I'm speaking in the, the period shortly after the November search of the home. Yes, at that time, we didn't know where they were at. Okay. Uh, did you reach out to anyone else? Did you, let me rephrase that, did you contact family and friends? Yeah, we, we contacted uh, Colby Ryan, uh, contacted Lori's niece, Melanie Boudreau. Um, we would, we were contacting anybody that would listen to us or, or take our calls, trying to find the whereabouts of the kids. Okay. During this time, did Lori Vallow ever call their expert police to report missing children? No, she didn't. Okay. Detective, if I say Nick Mick, do you know what that means? Yes, sir. What is that? It's an acronym for National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Did you contact them? We did. December 11th, we contacted Nick Mick and entered J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan as missing and endangered children. Okay. Did you ever alert the public 
that there was a search for J.J. Vallo and Tylee Ryan? Yes. When was that? Uh, that was December 20th, 2019. Uh, the police department gave a press release and tried to get those names out in public to assist us uh, in any way we can, in, in any way they could. Um, we also set up a tip hotline through NCMEC, through the FBI, and the Rexburg Police Department, so people with any tips or, or possible sightings of Tylee or JJ could call in, give us some information, and we would have officers or detectives follow up on each tip that came in. Okay. Did any of those tips lead to the location of J.J. Vallow or Tylee Ryan? No, they did not. Okay. Your Honor, if we could have a brief sidebar. Yes. May I continue? You may. <clears throat> Detective, are you aware, <clears throat> excuse me, if there was ever a child protection action filed regarding J.J. Vallow and Tylee, J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan? Yes, there was. What county was that filed in? Because we're going to object based on 404B. We previously objected on this and I know the court's ruled on that but we just like that put on the record all right thank you mr. Thomas uh, this does delve into some 404 B issues which were previously determined by the court in a ruling that was stated on the record on February 22nd 2023 <coughs> and for the reasons I would incorporate into that uh, finding today also incorporating the findings in that record I'll overrule the objection and you can continue this line of questioning mr. wood thank you were you in, uh, what county was that filed in? Uh, Madison, I believe. Okay. Were you involved? Yes, I was. How so? I was the one who wrote the affidavit. Okay. Um, are you aware if Lori Vallow was ever ordered to produce her children to the Rexburg police? Yes, she was. Okay. Are you aware if she ever produced her children to the Rexburg police? She did not. Okay. Detective, through your investigation, were you ever able to locate the whereabouts of Lori Vallow and Chad Dayville? Yes, we were. How did you do that? Through cell phone data, uh, tips coming in through the hotline that we had set up. Um, we were, we were able to determine that they were in Kauai. Okay. Kauai is in the island of Hawaii. Correct. Okay. Or one of the islands in Hawaii. Uh, did you go to Kauai? I did. Uh, why did you go there? We went there to assist the Kauai Police Department uh, with the service of that court order. Okay. Uh, and do you know if she was served with that order? She was. Do you know what date? She was served on January 25th, 2020. Okay. Did you do anything else while you were there? We did. Uh, we also assisted Kauai Police Department with the search warrant of Chad Daybell, Lori Vallow's rental vehicle, as well as their uh, condo they were renting in Princeville. Okay, and, and to clarify, did you perform those searches? No, I did not. Who performed those searches? Kauai Police Department. Okay. Were you present uh, when their condominium was searched? I was, yes. Okay. Um, and did you go in after the search was performed? Yes, I did. Okay. 
<clears throat> Did you find J.J. Vallow in that condominium? No, sir. Did you find Tyree Ryan? No. What did you observe in that condominium? Uh, normal furniture, uh, clothes, beds. Uh, just appeared that two uh, adult people were living there. Okay. And did you find any children's toys? No. Did you observe any children's medication? No. Uh, did you observe any children's clothes? No. Any teenage girl clothes? Nope. Okay. Did you see anything that would indicate that minor children had lived there? No. Oh, excuse me, had been living there? No. You stated that uh, the rental car that Chad and Lori Daybell were using was searched as well? That's correct. Did you observe that search? I did. Okay. Um, did you aid in that search? No, sir. Okay, you just observed it? Correct. Detective, I'm going to talk to you about the concept of proof of life. If I use the words proof of life, what does that mean? Any documentation that would be able to confirm if somebody was still alive. Okay. Um, did you ever, pursuant to your investigation, find a proof of... Well, let me rephrase that. Pursuant to your investigation... What was the last date you are aware of, of proof of life for Tylee Ryan? September 8th, 2019. What was that proof of life? It was a photograph taken in West Yellowstone. Okay. Um, and were you able to identify who Tylee Ryan was in that photograph? Yes. Okay. Pursuant to your investigation, what was the last date you were aware of proof of life for J.J. Vallow? September 22nd, 2019. Okay. Uh, what was that proof of life? It was a photograph taken of J.J. <clears throat> excuse me, on sitting on a couch. Okay. In Defendant Vallow's front room. All right. Your Honor, may I suggest this would be a good time for the mid-morning break? That's fine. We can go ahead and take our mid-morning break then. We will go for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we will resume again uh, until the lunch break. I would remind the people in attendance here, please take your personal effects with you and don't leave any bags or other items on the tables when you go. So we'll be in recess. All right. We Okay, we will go back on the record on case CR 22-21-1624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. Just finished our mid-morning break. Uh, we'll have the jurors return, and you can continue your direct examination, Mr. Wood, of this witness.
rise, please. All right, thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> okay, I'll remind the witness you're still under oath, and Mr. Wood, you can continue your direct examination. Thank you. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the witness be handed what's been marked as States Exhibit A through D. Is there a number corresponding? I, I apologize. States Exhibit 9A through 9D. Thank you. Detective, can you look over those and let me know when you've had a chance to review them? Okay. Do you recognize States Exhibit 9A through D? Yes, I do. What, do, what does that exhibit <clears throat> purport to be? This is the 2018 Jeep Wrangler that I seized on November 4th, 2019. Okay. And are those images true and accurate representations of what you witnessed uh, with that Jeep? Yes, sir. Your Honor, I'd ask that States Exhibit 9A through D be entered into evidence. Any objection? <laughs> you may. Thank you. Uh, these photographs, were they taken uh, at a police station or somewhere, or were these taken at, uh, where, where were they taken? They were taken in our impound bay at, at the police department. Okay. And the red evidence tape that was put on at the police station when you got there? That's correct. Okay. How did it get to the police station? It was towed. Towed? Okay. And where was it taken from? 565 Pioneer, just outside of the garage of 175. Okay. Thank you. No, no uh, objection, Judge. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. So exhibits 9A through D are all admitted to evidence and may be published. Thank you. Detective, you testified about this Jeep earlier, so I realize we're going back a little bit. Can you describe what's shown in States Exhibit 9A? That is a, a photograph of the Jeep that I had seized, like I said earlier, from the to view of the passenger side of the Jeep. Okay. Nine B. Uh, that's the rear view of the Jeep with uh, Texas plates that we were told about by Gilbert. Okay. States Exhibit 9C. That's a photograph of the inside of the Jeep taken from the driver's door. And 9E. It's also a photograph of the inside of the Jeep from the passenger side. Now, I'd ask that the witness be shown, states exhibits 
8 and 8. Sorry, I'm not speaking into the microphone. I'd ask that the witness be shown states exhibits 8M and 8N again. All right, we'll have the bailiff deliver those to the witness. Detective, uh, you testified earlier about these documents that they were found in the garage of apartment 175, correct? That's correct. And that one of those doc, at least one of those documents is an email? That's correct. I asked you earlier who the email was from. Uh, can, can you read the email address that that document is sent from? Judge, I would object here. I would, I would ask the court to uh, take the, uh, the exhibit as it is. And um, the best evidence is the exhibit itself, not what, what can be read or what can't be read. In honesty, I can't read it, and I don't think, I don't know. I, I, don't I just don't think it's appropriate to have him read. Okay, I don't understand the objection. There's a photograph that's been admitted, uh, as I understand, through uh, prior offering, and it's in evidence. So to the extent the witness wants to address what's on the photograph, it's permitted. Um, I don't know how hard it is to read or not. I don't have it in front of me. To me, it looks like chaddaybell at gmail.com. Okay, thank you. Detective, we had talked about, before the break, proof of life. And you spoke about some photos. Your Honor, I'd ask that uh, this, the witness be handed States Exhibit 29A and States Exhibits 13 and 14. Detective, before I ask any questions about that, I'm going to ask a few questions. Are you familiar with an iCloud account, Lori for Style at iCloud.com? Yes, I am. Is this uh, an account that you have reviewed in the course of your investigation? Yes, I have. Okay. Uh, Detective, can you look at Exhibit 29A? What does that document purport to be? It's a business certification record of the custodian of records of an Apple account. Okay. Does it list the Apple account on that document? Yes, sir, it does. Okay. Does it state anywhere on that document if the record was made at or near the time 
or from information transmitted by someone with knowledge of that document. Yes, sir. Okay. Does it state anywhere if that document, if if those documents were kept in the regular uh, course of the business? Yes, it does. Okay. Uh, does it state that making those records was a regular practice of that business or of that activity? Yes. Okay. Is this document, sw um, excuse me, signed under penalty of perjury? Yes, it is. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd ask that States Exhibit 29A and the accompanying records be allowed into evidence. All right, 29A is an exhibit. When you say the accompanying records, are you talking about uh, Exhibit 14? Uh, 13 and 14, Your Honor. Okay. Which I can lay further foundation for. Well, let's start there with Exhibit 29A. Is there any objection to Exhibit 29A being introduced? Uh, there is, Your Honor. What's the objection? May I have a dear and aid of objection? You may. Okay. Who, whose signature is on the, the document there? Catherine Calvert. And is it an actual signature or is it an a e signature? An e signature. Okay. So it's not her actual signature? Doesn't appear to be, no. Okay. Uh, have you talked to Catherine Calvert? I have not, no. In the course of your investigation, did you have an opportunity to contact anyone at Apple? I've spoken with people at Apple throughout the course of the investigation, yes. Who? Uh, off the top of my head, I don't, I don't have a name. Not in reference to Catherine Calvert, though. Your Honor, I'm going to ask for a sidebar. All right, thank you, Mr. Wood. Upon uh, discussing with counsel at sidebar, let me ask from the defense, is there any objection at this point to the admissions of Exhibit 29A and States 13 and 14? Uh, I don't have a copy of 13 and 14, but 29A is the business record, is that right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I don't have an objection to that. Okay, we'll start there then. Exhibit 29A is admitted into evidence, and you can continue your inquiry, Mr. Wood. Thank you. Detective Hermosillo, through the course of your investigation, have you reviewed the iCloud account, Lori for Style at iCloud.com? Yes, I have. Uh, from reviewing that account, are you able to tell who it belongs to? Yes. Who did it belong to? Lori Vallow. How did you know that? Based on the records on the account. Okay. And the, the photographs and everything attached to it. Okay. Detective, can you look at State's Exhibit, I believe it was 13 and 14? Do you recognize those documents? I do. What do they purport to be? Photographs of JJ, Tylee, and Alex in Yellowstone. Also a photograph of JJ uh, sitting on a couch in red pajamas. Okay. And did you observe those photographs in that iCloud account? Yes, I did. And are those true and accurate representations of the photographs found in the iCloud account, in the Lori for Style iCloud account? Yes, they are. Your Honor, I'd move for admission of State's Exhibits 13 and 14. Um, I'll take them up one at a time on Exhibit 13. Is there any objection? 13 is which one, the uh, Yellowstone photo? Yes. No objection. 
Exhibit 13 is admitted, and Exhibit 14 is a photo of a uh, child on the couch. No objection. All right, Exhibit 14 is also admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. May I publish those to the jury? <clears throat> yes. Mr. Thomas, you were able to see these courtesy copies before we published them, correct? Prior to publication, yes. Okay, thank you. You can publish them, Mr. Wood, if you'd like. Detective, uh, what do you observe in State's Exhibit 13? It's the photograph of J.J., Tylee, and Alex in Yellowstone. How do you know that's Yellowstone? I've, I've been there before. I recognize it. Okay. Detective, was there metadata associated with that photo? There was. Did it have a date? September 8th, 2019. Is that the same photo you referred to earlier when we were discussing proof of life? That's correct. What do you observe in State's Exhibit 14? The picture of J.J. Vallow in red pajamas on the couch. Okay. Uh, is that the same picture we were speaking about earlier when we spoke about proof of life? Yes, sir. Does that picture have metadata with it? It does. Uh, what was the date on that picture? September 22nd, 2019. Thank you. And perhaps I should have asked, uh, what is metadata? It's just information uh, associated with the picture, date, time, things like that. So, Detective, at this point, we've, sp we've spoken about your search for JJ and Tylee. Uh, did any part of your investigation uh, include working with Fremont County? It did. Uh, did any part of your investigation involve Tammy Daybell? It did. Okay. Uh, as part of your investigation, did you learn that Tammy Daybell had died? Yes, I did. Do you know when she died? October 19th, 2019. Okay, and did you learn of any other incident regarding Tammy? Yes. What was that? Uh, she, that she was possibly shot at on October 9th, 2019, outside of their residence. Okay. Detective, as part of your investigation... Did you help execute a search warrant on the Daybell residence? Yes, I did. When was that? June 9th, 2020. Uh, what is the address of that residence? 202 North, 1900 East, Fremont County. Okay. Now, just for clarification, what city is that listed in? It's listed in, in Rexburg. Okay. Um, but it's in Fremont County. Okay, because Rexburg is normally in Madison County. Correct. Correct. Okay. As you executed that search warrant on June 9th, uh, what was the first thing you did? <laughs> on June 9th, we... Got to Chad Daybell's residence at approximately 7 in the morning. Uh, we went and made contact, knocked on the front door. Uh, Chad Daybell's son, Mark Daybell, answered the door. He had a bowl of cereal in his hand. He was eating cereal. It was early in the morning. Um, and we informed Mark why we were there uh, and that we needed to speak with Chad Daybell. Okay. Uh, then what happened? Mark told us that his dad, Chad, was still asleep, uh, 
and directed us to Chad's room, uh, which is a, it's like a loft room that was above the garage area. So he walked us through the house and to the stairwell of Chad's room. Okay. Uh, and what did you observe then? We walked up the stairwell, announced ourselves. Uh, Chad was still asleep in bed as we came around the little half wall. Uh, Chad sat up. Uh, we told Chad why we were there, that we had a search warrant, search the property and the residence. Uh, he asked if he can get dressed and get some clothes on. We allowed him to do that. And then he walked back downstairs with us into the kitchen area. Okay. Um, what happened then? Chad asked to contact his attorney, and at that time it was Mark Means. Uh, Chad was allowed to contact his attorney. Uh, he spoke on the phone with his attorney in the kitchen area. Um, his attorney asked to speak with one of our detectives, but was referred to speak with the prosecutor at that time. Okay. What happened after that? After that, we went into the front room where Chad was given a copy of the search warrant. Uh, he sat in the recliner closest to the door. Uh, he reviewed the search warrant. His children at that time were sitting on the couch across from him. Um, he asked if he needed to leave or his children needed to leave, and we explained to them they didn't need to leave. They were free to stay, but if they stayed, they would be accompanied by an officer for safety reasons. Um, at that point, his children stated they were going to go, and Chad stated he didn't know whether he was going to go or not, um, but asked to go make a phone call out in his vehicle that was parked in the driveway. Okay. Uh, what did you do then? At that time, the children were allowed to leave. Uh, we walked outside in the front yard area. Uh, Chad got into the uh, driver's seat of a vehicle that was backed into the driveway. He was on the phone talking. Uh, in the meantime, there were the FBI ERT team, the evidence recovery team, arrived on scene along with other detectives now that the scene was safe to arrive. Um, and they began marking off different areas in the backyard, uh, just setting up for the search warrant and what we needed to do that day. Okay. Who, who aided, <clears throat> who was a part of serving that search warrant that day in terms of law enforcement? The FBI, uh, the FBI evidence re recovery team, Fremont County Sheriff's Office, Rexburg Police Department, uh, the Idaho Attorney General's Office, uh, I believe that was it. And did you assist in the actual search that day? Yes, I did. You spoke about Mr. Daybell or Chad Daybell sitting in a vehicle in his driveway, correct? Correct. Were you able, did you observe him, uh, were you able to observe his behavior during that time? I was. Uh, Mr. Daybell was sitting in the driver's side facing west. Um, he was on the phone and while he was on the phone, he had the phone in his right hand. He was intently looking over his right shoulder. Um, he would talk for a second, look back over his right shoulder, watching what was going on behind him to his left, to his right, excuse me. So we positioned ourselves to see exactly what Mr. Daybell was concerned or, or looking at. Uh, and when we positioned ourselves that way, we could see Mr. Daybell uh, 
Your Honor, I'm going to object. This is information that's calling for speculation, and he's speculating about what Mr. Daybell was seeing at the time. Your Honor, I can ask some more questions. All right. The objection is sustained, but nothing to strike on the response yet. If you'll ask another question, Mr. Williams. At any time, did you go stand by where Mr. Daybell was sitting? We did. Okay. Did you speak with him at all? We did. What did you say to him? I asked Mr. Daybell if he needed a coat, because at that time he was getting out of the vehicle. Okay. You testified that he had been looking over his shoulder. Correct. And that you perceived he was looking in a specific direction. Correct. When you went and stood by where Mr. Daybell was, did you look in the direction that it appeared he had been looking in? I did. What did you observe when you looked in that direction? I observed the tree and the pond area on that side of the property. Okay. After that, what did you do to aid in the search of Chad Daybell's property? We were given certain tasks by the head of the FBI ERT to do different things. There were multiple people there. So at that point, my original task was to sift through the fire pit that was located on the property. And what was the purpose of that? To see if there was anything of evidentiary value in the fire pit. Okay. You spoke about a pond area. Did you observe any activity by the search team in the pond area that day? Yes, I did. When did that start? Time-wise? Yes. Roughly 9 o'clock maybe in the morning. And what did you observe? While we were sifting through the fire pit, there were a lot of people going towards the pond area underneath the tree. And so we were called over to assist in that location. One moment. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the witness be hand states Exhibit 10A, which will be offered as a demonstrative exhibit. Just that for now. Detective Hermosillo, do you recognize States Exhibit 10A? Yes, I do. Okay. Did you produce States Exhibit 10A? I did. What tool did you use to do that? Google Earth. Okay. And do you recognize the property in 10A? Yes. Okay. Was the purpose of producing that to aid the jury in understanding the various locations you're talking about today? That's correct. And is that a – you have visited – have you been on that specific property? Yes, sir. And is that a true and accurate representation of the Daybell property? Yes, sir. Your Honor, I ask that States Exhibit 10A be entered for demonstrative purposes to aid the jury in understanding these locations. Any objection? May I aid in an objection, Judge? May I go out here? Yes. 
so you indicate that you are depicting this as a true and accurate uh, depiction of the property. Have you ever done a flyover of this property? No. Okay. Uh, so you've never seen the aerial view of what this property looks like? Not the aerial view, no. But I've I've walked the perimeter of that property several times. And you looked up? I would imagine I would have looked up at some point. And you saw the sky? Probably. And you don't know what it looks like from the sky, right? That's correct. Okay. I'm going to object, Judge. This is, he doesn't have uh, the <coughs> proper personal, uh, he doesn't have the foundation to be able to say that this is what it is, what it purports to be. All right. What's the response from the state on the objection? Your Honor, uh, the detective himself has been on the property multiple times. <clears throat> uh, as he's testified, uh, he was able to produce this just using Google Earth. <laughs> Uh, and it's sim again, it's simply to aid the jury in uh, the location of, of the, the items he'll be discussing today. Uh, for demonstrative purposes, I think the state, I, I think he has more than laid adequate foundation for that document to come in. All right. The objections overruled. The court does find there's been sufficient foundation laid to introduce this, not for evidentiary purposes, but for demonstrative purposes to assist the jury in. Uh, reviewing or referring to locations. So for that limited purpose, the exhibit is admitted, um, states 10A. Detective, earlier you had talked about the front driveway. Is that? Can you see where I'm pointing with my pen? Objection yes. is leading, Judge. I'm Over, just overruled. I'm just asking a question. Is this the leading question? I'm, I'm objecting. To the I way. overruled it, Mr. Okay. Combs. Is this the front driveway you spoke of earlier? That's correct. Okay. Um, to your knowledge, is all of the property in this picture Chad Daybell's property? Yes. Okay. Is this the home? Can you see where my pen is pointing? Yes. Is this the home you went into when you made contact with Mr. Daybell that day? Yes. Okay. Is this the pond area that we you referred to earlier. Yes, it is. And you mentioned a tree by it. Is, is this that tree? Yes, it is. Thank you. Detective, you, uh, you talked about activity going on there. Did, did you go over to that area? I did. Okay. And what did you observe happening there? Initially, uh, we had located a an area of concern because there was uh, longer grass and and weeds that were longer than about a four by two section where there was there was shorter grass and just a little bit of dirt showing. So initially, that's what caught our attention in that area. Okay. Uh, what happened there? Uh, the evidence recovery team began doing their thing as far as marking it off um, and, and getting it ready to, to excavate. Okay. Did you witness that excavation? I did. <laughs> um. As that excavation took place, uh, what did you observe? <clears throat> I observed uh, the ERT team remove the top layer of soil in that area. Um, 
as they began removing the top layer of soil, it began to expose three large white rocks. Uh, and at that point, uh, there was a strong odor of, uh, through my training experience, that was a decomposing body. Okay. Is that something you've smelled before? Unfortunately, yes. Okay. Uh, did they uncover those rocks? They did. Under, under the, the three large rocks, there was two pieces of wood paneling, thin wood paneling, um, under the, under the rocks. Okay. Um, were those removed? They were removed. Okay. What happened after that? Or what did you observe after that? Once we removed the, the wood paneling, there were, you could definitely see a difference in soil. Uh, the soil began to look moist. Um, so you had a, a definite distinction between the soil on the outside and the soil in the middle of this area where we began excavating. Um, and so the ERT team slowly, methodically started brushing away the, the moist soil where we were at. Okay, and I, I just want to ask you a clarifying question. Were you physically aiding in the excavation? Not then, I was not, no. Okay. Uh, were you watching the evidence for the FBI team do that? Yes, I was watching them do that. Once those panels were, well, you've already testified to that. Uh, what what did you observe next? They began removing the soil. Once they started removing the soil, slowly, methodically, we began to see a black, round uh, object starting to protrude through the dirt. Um, just just a few inches deep. It wasn't very deep at all before we saw the, the the round object. It appeared, looking at it, it appeared to be like a, a texture of a plastic bag. Okay. Uh, did they continue to uncover that? They did. What did you observe? They scraped away some more soil uh, around that round object. And it began to take the shape of the crown of, it looked like the crown of a head protruding through the dirt. Okay. What action was taken next? Uh, we continued, or they continued to dig around that, what we started to call the burial site, um, and eventually exposed uh, what appeared to be a small, body wrapped in black plastic. Okay. Uh, at any time, was that plastic cut into? The top of the plastic was cut into where uh, where it had been exposed on the crown of the head, yes. Okay. And do you know what the purpose for that was? <clears throat> uh, we wanted to see exactly what it was without uh, manipulating or damaging any of the evidence. So the ERT leader, Steve Daniels, used a, a sharp instrument, made a slit down the, the top of the plastic. Uh, it exposed a piece of white plastic underneath that. Uh, a slit was made in the white plastic and eventually we were able to see that look like brown human hair. Okay. What did you observe at that point? At that point, we were then told that Chad Daybell was uh, leaving his daughter's residence at a high rate of speed. His daughter lives caddy corner to his residence. Um, so we were told he was leaving at a high rate of speed. Um, and at that time, uh, Chad Daybell was 
pulled over and taken into custody. Okay. At that time, did you re uh, return to what you referred to as the burial site by the tree? Yes, I did. Okay. What did you observe after that? <clears throat> Eventually, all the dirt was removed from the the small body wrapped in plastic. Um, the body was then uh, photographed. ERT took their measurements. Uh, the body was eventually removed from the burial site and put into a black body bag which was locked for evidence purposes and placed in the back of the coroner's vehicle on scene. I want to ask you a clarifying question. Uh, you're referring to a body. <clears throat> had you, other than the slit in the head area, you, testif you testified correct that this, bo this body was in a black plastic bag? Correct. correct. Did you remove any of the other black plastic at that time? No, it was just, when I testified to that, it was just the shape of a small body wrapped in black plastic. Okay. And you state, uh, what was done with that after it was removed from that site? It was placed in the back of the coroner's vehicle uh, and driven to the morgue uh, by the Fremont County coroner and a Fremont County deputy. Uh, myself and Lieutenant Ron Ball followed behind that vehicle all the way until we got to the morgue where it was turned over. Okay. Uh, after you took that uh, body to the morgue, what did you do? We went back to the Daybell residence uh, to assist with, with further excavation. Okay. Was there another area that was searched in on the Daybell residence that day? There was. And if I could ask, is there a, a pointer that the witness can use? I think we do have a laser pointer available. This right here. Yeah. For the record, Mr. Woodwin, there is pointing. If you would just verbally describe what's being pointed out, that'll help it be clear later when it's read. Thank you. Um, Detective, uh, before we move on, can you uh, use the pointer to point to the area we've recently been dis discussing? Objection vague. Can Discuss point the whole to property, the area Judge. Where, Hang on a sec. Pending objection. Sorry. Overruled. You can inquire. Okay. Well, and to clarify, can you point to the area where the body was found in black plastic? There is a tree right here on this side of the tree, just underneath. Uh, the body was found in black plastic just underneath that tree. Okay. Thank you. You had mentioned a fire pit earlier. Yes, sir. Can you point to where that is? fire pit is right around here. Okay. All right. So you testified you went up to uh, the morgue at the hospital, and you, at that point you came back to the Daybell residence on June 9th, correct? Correct. Uh, and I had asked if there was another area being searched that day. Can you point to where that other area is? Right here. Okay. Could you describe that, Mr. Yes. Wood, please? Can you, can you describe where you're pointing? So through the course of our investigation, it was brought up that uh, that was known to the Daybell family as the Pet Cemetery. And uh, they described the Pet Cemetery as having a little black dog statue that was right next to the pet cemetery, so that's how we knew it as the pet cemetery. And here there's a black dog statue, and so this was the pet cemetery. Yeah. 
Thank you. And what did you observe when you returned uh, from the morgue? When I returned, they were, had already, the ERT team had already began excavating a part of that pet cemetery. Um, they had dug down a little bit, um, not too much, and that's when I arrived back on scene. Okay. And what did you do at that point? At that point, uh, I walked over to the pet cemetery area. I began observing. Um, in digging down, they located uh, items of interest that we needed to slow down and, and dig more methodically. So at that point, uh, a few of us got on our hands and knees and began digging um, around this this uh, moist section of dirt. Okay. Uh, and then what did you observe? As we began digging, uh, we were on our hands and knees. Um, we started to uncover uh, just burnt flesh, um, charred bone, um, the, the smell was, uh, again, of a decomposing body. Um, we had to take turns digging because the smell was so bad. We could only dig for a couple minutes. Um, so we slowly began digging that. You, when you say slowly, uh, what tools were you using to dig? Paint brushes. Um, little trowels, just something so we can get just a little bit of dirt up without damaging anything in the ground. Okay. And what did you find in that spot? <clears throat> Eventually we uncovered uh, bits and pieces of Tylee, who we assumed was Tylee. Um, that had been burned. Uh, there were pieces of bone, like I said, charred, charred flesh. Um, uh, just the best I can describe is just globs of 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 flesh that were falling apart. Okay. And did you keep digging down? We did. Did you find anything further? Once we removed some of that, uh, underneath there was another um, round uh, glob of, and, and sorry for the, that's the best way I can describe it, um, just burnt flesh, bone, all kind of what appeared to be in a in a in a put in a green bucket. Um, the bucket had melted, so it was kind of uh, disformed, and and the flesh and bone and um, was was all kind of stuffed in that melted bucket, um, and so we began digging around that as well. Okay. Um, and what happened as you did that? <clears throat> we were able to, like I said, we were only able to work a couple minutes before we'd have to get switched out by their detectives. Um, we were able to get down all the way to the bottom of the mass and what the goal was was try to get to the bottom to be able to lift it onto a tarp or a body bag um, as we got down to the bottom um, there was a partial human skull underneath the melted bucket okay did you attempt to lift it out we did what um, happened 
there were three or four of us that kind of climbed in this little hole and we attempted to lift it out but it kind of broke apart because it wasn't really being held in by anything um, and so it kind of broke apart and we had to go in and pick up the pieces out of the hole and put them back into the body bag. Okay. Detective, uh, at this point in your search, was this still on June 9th or was this another day? June 9th. Okay. Uh, at any point, uh, did you have to stop working on June 9th? We did. Uh, it was getting late in the evening. <clears throat> um, and so we ended up just deciding to secure the scene and be done for the day. Okay. And when you say secure the scene, what did that mean? Well, the scene was roped off with crime scene tape. Um, there were several officers from Rexburg Police Department, uh, Fremont County Sheriff's Office, um, that were scheduled to be there all night to watch the scene. We had two big light trucks that were uh, given to us by the fire department, also Fremont County Sheriff's Office, to illuminate the scene all night to make sure that the scene wasn't compromised throughout the night. Okay. And so the search continued on June 10th? Correct. Uh, what did you observe on June 10th? We went back to that second burial site where Tylee was buried. Um, continued to excavate, uh, get all the pieces and parts out of that hole that um, we needed to get out. Um, we dug down once we got all the pieces and, and, the, and the bones and flesh out of the hole. Uh, we dug down a little further um, because the ground was still moist, the soil was still moist, so we wanted to make sure we got everything. Um, there were bits and pieces that we found. Once we dug down more, there were, there were teeth and um, different parts a little bit further down, but um, we just finished with that. And then Tylee was also put into a body bag and transferred to the morgue in the same manner that we took J.J. And was that at the morgue at Madison Memorial Hospital? It was. In Rexburg, Idaho? Correct. Okay. After those remains you've discussed were recovered, what was the next part of your investigation? At that point, uh, once we got Tylee out of the ground, uh, we determined that we were going to take J.J. and Tylee to the Ada County Coroner's Office to get ready for an autopsy the next day. So at that point, they were picked up. J.J. and Tylee were picked up from the morgue by uh, the Fremont County Coroner Brenda Dye and Detective Kai Kamanu, who drove the the coroner's vehicle and myself and Lieutenant Ron Ball followed behind that vehicle all the way to Boise uh, where they were dropped off at the Ada County Coroner's office. And I'm sorry, what date was that? It was June 10th. Okay. Um, did anything else happen on June 10th? Uh, no. Okay. Your Honor, can I have a quick sidebar? Yes. Continue your inquiry. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd ask that the witness be handed what's been marked to State's Exhibit 10B through 10L.
Detective, if you can review those and let me know when you're done. Okay. Do you recognize those documents? I do. What do they purport to be? Uh, photographs taken uh, that day at the search warrant at Mr. Daybell's property. Uh, what day was that? June 9th, 2020. Okay. And you were present that day? That's correct. All right. Uh, and do you recognize each of those individual photos? Yes. Are they true and accurate representations of what you witnessed that day? They are. Your Honor, the state would move for admission of state's exhibit uh, 10B through, I believe, through L. Any objection? May I have one here, Nate? You may. <clears throat> so uh, 10B, that is a photograph of, uh, what is that? Is that, what is that? It's the front of Mr. Daybell's residence. Okay. And you didn't take that photograph? I did not. Okay. But you recognize the front of the residence? That's correct. Okay. Uh, 10C, what is that? That is a photograph of the fire pit. You didn't take that photograph? No, sir. Was that taken on the day that you were there? It was. Okay. Did you see the photograph being taken? I did not. Okay. Your Honor, I'm going to object on relevance. Uh, these don't go to foundation. He's already laid an adequate foundation. Is there a objection you're considering that's based on foundation? Or what's the, what's the basis of this line of four dark? Well, I, I don't know when these were taken. I don't know who took them. And he's saying that all this happened and he saw all of it happen. Okay, well, we'll just go through them individually then, take up an objection one by one. So uh, what's the objection on 10B? 10B, no objection. All right, 10B is admitted. Let's move on to 10C, which has been offered. Is there an objection? No, no objection. All right, 10C is admitted. 10D, is there an objection to that photograph? Uh... No. All right, D, 10 yes. D is admitted. 10 E, is there an objection to that? 10 E, yes, there's an objection. What is the objection? I don't know, I don't know what this is. It's just a photograph of a piece of some grass. All right, Mr. Wood, response. Unworthy Detective, 10. do you have photographed a, uh, 10 E in front of you? I do. Okay. Uh, what does that purport to be? That is the, what I earlier testified to with the long grass and the short grass and a little bit of dirt sticking out where J.J. Vallo was eventually uncovered. That's the location. And do you know where this location is? Yes. Can you point to it on the demonstrative exhibit 10A? And what are you pointing at? It's just the east side, northeast side of the tree next to the pond area. Okay, and the image depicted in 10E, you saw that with your own eyes? That's correct. Is that a true and accurate representation of what you witnessed that day? Yes, it is. State moves again for admission of 10E. Any objection? With that foundation, Your Honor, no objection. All right, thank you, Mr. Thomas. So 10E will be admitted. Let's next look at 10F. Is there an objection to that? There is, Your Honor. I don't know what that is either. All right. Mr. Wood, if you'd lay some extra foundation on that one, please. Detective, do you have State's Exhibit 10F in front of you? I do. What does it purport to be? That's the exact same location as 10E, except with the topsoil uncovered. Okay. Uh, and is that a true and accurate representation of what you witnessed that day? It is. Thank you. Your Honor, based on what he's just stated and and the foundation he laid for the previous photograph, we'd move for the uh, admission of, what number are we on? 10F. 10F. Any objection? 
Yes, Your Honor. I may have one idea in need of an objection. Uh, briefly, Mr. Thomas, yes. Thank you. So you indicated that you were working at the fire pit, which would have been 10C, uh, when other people were working on the uh, burial site of JJ. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. Okay. So I was working at the fire pit. Um, then we were called down to the area of the pond area because they had located that original spot from 10E. So when I got there, that's when I got there is 10E. I see. Okay, and you remained there throughout the time when they found uh, what was purported to be JJ's body? That's correct. Okay. I have no objection, Your Honor. Your Honor. Okay. okay. To the remainder. All right, no. Of the objection uh, to the, the remainder. All right, so... Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, then, Mr. Thomas, without objection, 10F will be admitted, 10G, 10H, 10I, 10J, 10K, and 10L are all admitted into evidence. Mr. Wood, you can continue your examination. Thank you. Detective, can you uh, describe what you observed in State's Exhibit 10B that morning? That's the, the front of Mr. Daybell's residence. Uh, he was parked in a vehicle just in front of this vehicle backed in. So that's not the vehicle that, that Mr. Daybell was sitting in, but parked in front of that one backed in. Okay. Um and is that the area where you went, uh, where you observed him looking over his shoulder? That's correct. And you testified that you went to that same location uh, to see where he was looking, correct? Correct. Uh, can you use the pointer and show what you saw when you did that? So when I was standing next to Mr. Daybill's vehicle... <laughs> It was in this location here. Everybody see that pointer? Your Honor, I wonder if we could dim the lights a little bit. Yes. <laughs> I was standing in this location on the driver's side. He was backed in on the driver's side of Mr. Daybell's vehicle. And when I was looking this way, it was directly to this tree here which is where J.J. was located, just underneath this tree. Thank you. Detective, what did you observe in State's Exhibit 10C? That's the fire pit uh, where I was originally tasked to work. Um, in the fire pit, we also located uh, burnt bone fragments and teeth. What do you observe in State's Exhibit 10D? That's standing at the, the west side of the property facing east. Oh, where is it? And this tree is the tree that JJ was buried underneath, just on the other side of this tree. Your Honor, I'm, I'm concerned that the pointer isn't very visible. We probably have another one. Is there a backup pointer we've got? Maybe.
And if not, would it be possible for the, the witness to stand at the picture and point? Pretty sure. Just a moment. I think we can get one rounded up here. While we're waiting on a quick break here for that pointer, if anybody would like to stand up, stretch their legs, that's certainly fine. You can do that. Please be seated. <clears throat> Go ahead, Mr. Wood. Did, um, can I inquire? Did we get another pointer? We yes. Did. Well, can we just ask? Tech? Okay. That's much better. Thank yes. you. I appreciate that. All right, Detective Fermacio, I'm going to ask again, uh, what did you observe in State's Exhibit 10D. This is standing on the west side of the property facing east. Uh, the tree in the photograph is uh, where JJ was buried underneath. And he was just buried right underneath, right there where that pointer is. Okay. Pointer is, I'm sorry. Detective, can you just uh, describe what you observed in State's Exhibit 10E? That's the photograph that when we were originally working at the fire pit, we were called over. Uh, that's directly underneath the tree. Um, and as I earlier testified, the difference in weed growth um, and the level of, of grass and a little bit of dirt showing um, brought our attention over there. So that's what we originally had seen. Okay. Uh, just due to the, the lighting, can you use the pointer to sh uh, point out uh, those things you were talking about where the grass is longer, where it's shorter? The grass is longer up here, and it's shorter through here. Thank you. What did you observe in State's Exhibit 10F? That's after, this is a photograph of after we had removed the topsoil. Uh, you can see we started to, just the first little layer of topsoil once it re was removed you could see the beginning of the white rocks starting to protrude through the the top of the dirt there what did you let's see what did you observe in states exhibit 10g this is a photograph of once that topsoil was removed, the the three white large rocks, the small rock. You can see uh, right here is uh, part of the wood paneling I described earlier uh, underneath the rocks. We also noticed that the roots were cut uh, along the burial site. Um, so just to clarify, uh, the excavation team did not cut those roots? That's correct. They were already cut. Okay. What did you observe in State's Exhibit 10H? 
This is a photograph once we remove the large white rocks, uh, the wood paneling that was underneath them, thin wood paneling. Okay. Uh, you had testified earlier about a smell. Correct. Uh, were you able to uh, notice that smell at this point in the excavation? Absolutely. As soon as we removed the top soil, we were able to smell. Okay. What did you observe in States Exhibit 10I? This is a photograph of when the wood paneling was removed. As I testified earlier, the, the soil began to look different. It began to look moist. Um, and we started to see that black plastic round object starting to show through the dirt. Can you use the pointer to point out that? So this plastic? is the, the, the moist soil that we started to see. And this is the black round plastic that started to come through. Can you tell the jury what you observed in States Exhibit 10J? Once we started to slowly excavate more of the soil, uh, we were able to uncover a little bit more of the, the round plastic. And this is where we, it looked like to be the crown of a, of a head sticking through the dirt. What did you observe in State's Exhibit 10K? Once we saw the crown of the head sticking through the dirt, uh, a, a small, sharp instrument was used to cut through the plastic, just enough to expose what was underneath. Um, after we cut through the black plastic, there was another layer of white plastic underneath that. We cut through that, and that's when we were able to see what appeared to be brown human hair uh, sticking out from the white plastic. So there's pieces of hair uh, on top of the, the white plastic that have kind of that fell off of the head. Um, also, you can see part of the black plastic starting to take shape uh, in the burial site. And what do you observe in States Exhibit 10L? This is where we removed the dirt off of the plastic. Um, it's in the shape of a, a small human body that looks to be in the black plastic. Um, and at that point, this is where we removed um, JJ and placed him in a body bag and into the coroner's vehicle just as, as is. And what did you observe in State's Exhibit 10M? After we removed JJ, um, there was still moist soil. Council, I apologize. Which exhibit are we on now? 10M. We stopped at L, I think. Oh. with what was previously moved and admitted. And I don't think I have a courtesy copy of M yet. Oh, I do. Apologies. So this has not you, yet been admitted. Okay. Your Honor, if this could be handed back up to the uh, witness and I'll... All right. The witness we handed exhibit states 10M. Detective, do you recognize states exhibit 10M? Yes. Um, 
Do you recognize that? Uh, what does that document purport to be? Uh, the burial site where we took JJ out of. Okay, and uh, were you uh, were you there the day that photograph was taken? That's correct. And did you observe that with your own eyes? But yeah, I helped lift him out of the burial site. Is that photograph a true and accurate representation of what you witnessed that day? Yes, it is. Your Honor, the state moves for uh, admission of <coughs> State's Exhibit 10M. Any objection? No. All right, Exhibit 10M, 10M is admitted, and you can publish it, Mr. Wood. Thank you. Detective, what do you observe in State's Exhibit 10M? Um, that's the moist soil that was underneath JJ once we removed him. Uh, that's just from the body breaking down, body decomposition. Um, so we dug further than that moist soil just to make sure we got everything, and, and that's what that's a photograph of. Okay. Did you find anything else buried there? No. Okay. Just one moment, Your Honor. Let me have a brief sidebar, please. I just had a brief sidebar with counsel discussing our scheduling for today. Uh, given the nature of the evidence we're about to go into and the time of the day, I'm going to suggest that we end up taking our lunch break at this time. Uh, we'll take a little longer lunch than typically we would, so we'll try to start back up here at 1245, so a little over an hour, and uh, we will be in recess until then. So please rise for the journey. Your Honor, before we start, they just brought Lori up. Can we have a, a minute to talk to her, either in the back hallway or downstairs? You may. Yeah, uh, let's go ahead and we'll just continue the lunch recess a little bit. If you'd like to exit with your client, we'll do that, and then we'll go back on the record. Thank you. Please be seated. Okay, we're back on the record on case CR 22-211624, State versus Lori Noreen Vallow. We broke for lunch and had a long lunch break. A legal issues arisen that the court did take up a sidebar with counsel off the record. Uh, have been advised of a situation that needs to be argued and determined outside of the presence of the jury at this time. So... Mr. 
uh, Archibald, Mr. Thomas, I'm aware that your client would have a request at this time. I need to consider that request and hear argument from the state. We'll make a determination and then proceed forward uh, regardless of the determination with additional evidence today. So, uh, Mr. Is, would it be Mr. Thomas or Mr. Archibald making the motion at this time? I will, Your Honor. All right. Mr. Archibald, if you'd like to make your motion at this time, you may. Your Honor, uh, my client wishes to waive her presence at the testimony for the remainder of the day. Uh, it was emotional this morning, and uh, she indicated to us she did not want to attend this afternoon. There is a, a rule that contemplates a defendant waiving their presence. I would ask the court to review that rule and any relevant case law. Uh, we would remind the court of the history of this case with my client, her uh, fragile state of mind, the mental health concerns, the myriad reports that have been filed uh, about her mental health do uh, justify such a request. All right. Thank you, Mr. Archibald. Uh, who's going to respond on behalf of the state? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I will be responding for the state. Your Honor, Idaho Rule 43 favors a defendant being present for the duration of trial. While there are some exceptions outlined in doing some quick research, case law indicates that there is no absolute right for a defendant not to be present. They do, however, have an absolute right to be present at trial. In addition, case law is clear, as well as Idaho Rule 43, that a court can require the defendants present. Similarly, to the extent that a court can order a disruptive defendant to be bound and gagged and remain in court, it is clear this is how important it is to have a defendant present for the proceedings. Further, the state of Idaho also has a right to have the defendant present for the duration of trial. This isn't the first time that this court has dealt with the defendant's refusal to participate in the proceedings or come out for proceedings. We respect that this is that it is the court and not the defendant that controls the proceedings and how they move forward. If this court is to consider the request of the defense counsel for the defendant not to be present, the state would request that this court conduct an inquiry with the defendant on the record. I think case law is clear that that is a requirement in order for a finding that the defendant does not do, need to be present. But I would again indicate case law is very clear, as well as Rule 43, that this court could override the defendant's request not to be present and require her presence in the courtroom. Further, if the court is to have the inquiry and determine that the defendant is going to be allowed to refuse to participate in certain portions of the proceedings, the state would request a jury instruction reflecting such that it was due to no fault of the state, but that the defendant chose not to be present for certain portions or certain evidence being presented. We would further request that, this, that we receive a ruling today that the state will absolutely be able to comment during closing arguments on the defendant's refusal to be present during the showing of certain evidence. And we would ask that that ruling go into effect for any further portions of the trial outside of just today if the court were to allow the defendant not to be present and we run into this issue again, that would be an ongoing request from the state. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Blake. Um, Mr. Archibald, having heard the state's argument, is there any rebuttal argument? I think uh, jury instructions at this point would be premature. So uh, typically there's a jury instruction conference at the end of the case. So I'd ask the court to reserve ruling on that matter. All right. Thank you, Mr. Archibald. All right. Well, this issue came up over the lunch hour. I've spent some time with my staff attorney also researching the issue. I've heard argument from counsel, and I appreciate you taking the time to quickly research that issue. Um, I am prepared to make a ruling. So Idaho Criminal Rule 43 is the rule that deals with the presence of the defendant. In addition, a defendant has the right to be present at their trial uh, as secured by both the United States Constitution and the Idaho Constitutions. Uh, 
and there is some authority out there about a voluntary or involuntary absence after trial started. So walking through the rule, <coughs> presence is required under 43A subsection 3 at every stage of the trial, including the impaneling of the jury and the return of the verdict. And then there's a set of presence not required uh, list under 43B, which don't apply here. And then Part C is waiving continued presence. So the rule does have some contemplation about presence being waived. And that states in general, a defendant who was initially present at trial or other proceedings waives the right to be present under the following circumstances. The first circumstance, Part A, when the defendant is voluntarily absent after the trial has begun, regardless of whether the court informed the defendant of an obligation to remain during trial. Uh, the rule goes on to talk about the waiver's effect under Part C2. If the defendant waives the right to be present, the proceeding may continue to completion, including the verdict's return and sentencing during the defendant's absence. Uh, there's one case in Idaho fairly recent from 2021 called State versus Crop 168 Idaho 948 and that goes through an analysis of the defendant's presence. Um, it states that the right to be present at trial is secured by both the United States Constitution and the Idaho Constitution. Like other constitutional rights, the right to be present can be waived. A defendant, after having been present at the trial's inception, can waive this constitutional right through a later voluntary absence. And then it talks about a three-step process to determine whether an absence is voluntary or not. Most of the cases on this issue deal with people who were there for part of their trial and then just felt to show up maybe for the second, third day of trial or something, and what kind of finding would constitute that to be a voluntary absence if the state continues to proceed forward with the case in the absence of the defendant. There's not really any controlling law I've seen in Idaho on what the authority of the court is to override a request for a defendant to be voluntarily absent. But interestingly, as has been mentioned and argued by the state, the rule under waiving continued presence under Rule 43C1B talks about the authority a court would have to have a disruptive defendant continue to be present during trial, um, even if ordered by a court to, quote, bind and gag the defendant. So I think the rule contemplates that absences may occur. I think that provision of the rule also clearly indicates that the court does have the authority to order the appearance of the defendant in facing trial and proceedings and the right of the parties to have the defendant present, including the defendant's own constitutional rights. And having considered the authority and not finding any cited case law to the contrary, I do think this court has the authority to override that request of the defendant to voluntarily excuse herself from certain portions of the trial and not others where she's been here for the first uh, day and a half of trial. And I do find that within the court's authority to conduct this trial, her presence can and should be required in order to ensure her due process rights and also to ensure a fair trial on behalf of the state. So with that uh, having been considered, I have carefully considered the request of the defendant in this case who is here present, and I am denying her request to excuse herself from this section of the proceedings that are occurring in the evidence presented by the state's case in chief. So that will be the court's ruling on that. I'll prepare a order to that effect, which will be entered into this case, and we will move forward with additional evidence to be presented in the defendant's presence. Uh, Mr. Archibald, any questions on that ruling? No, Your Honor. 
Does the state have any questions on the ruling? No, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Thank you, counsel. At this time, then, we'll have the jury brought back in for additional evidence. All right, thank you. Please be seated. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we did take an inordinately long lunch break. I apologize, as you may have recalled from one of the many instructions you received when this case began. At times, there are delays where we are working behind the scenes on legal issues, and that's what was occurring outside of your presence. So I wanted to give you an explanation there. We're still committed to our trial schedule for the day of when I advised you we'd be ending each day roughly. So with that in mind, we do have continued testimony from the witness who has previously been placed under oath, Detective Hermosillo. And Mr. Wood, you can continue with your direct examination at this time. Thank you, Your Honor. Detective Hermosillo, you testified earlier about meeting Chad Daybell and Alex Cox, correct? That's correct. And you testified that you found Mr. Daybell's answer to one of your questions suspicious because you knew he was married to Lori Daybell, correct? Correct. Through your investigation, do you know when they were married? November 5th, 2019. Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness be handed what's marked as State's Exhibit 30, and it will be offered as a demonstrative exhibit. Detective, so far throughout this trial, there have been many names and individuals listed. Did you put together a chart with associated pictures and names to aid the jury in understanding your testimony? I did. And did you do that to also help the jury keep track of the numerous individuals in this case? Yes. Can you look at State's Exhibit 30? What does that purport to be? The exhibit I created with the various names and pictures. Okay. And are those names matched to the pictures? Yes. Of the individuals who they purport to be? Yes. Your Honor, for demonstrative purposes and to aid the jury, I'd ask that State's Exhibit 30 be entered into evidence. Any objection? 
I've not received Exhibit 30. I have 31 and 30, 31A and 31B. For demonstrative purposes, we have no objection to 30. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, exhibit 30 can be admitted for demonstrative purposes. Thank you, Your Honor. May I publish that to the jury? Yes, you may. Detective, who do you observe on State's Exhibit 30? Lori Vallow Daybell. And then, actually, I'm going to stop you. Can you use the pointer and point to who you're talking about? Lori Vallow Daybell, Charles Vallow, Alex Cox, Chad Daybell, Tammy Daybell, Tylee Ryan, Joshua J.J. Vallow, and Melanie Pulowski, also known as Melanie Boudreaux. Okay. Your Honor, I'd also ask that the witness be handed State's Exhibits 31A and 31B. These will also be offered for demonstrative purposes. Detective, do you recognize State's Exhibits 31A and 31B? I do. Okay. Uh, there have been many dates and events discussed thus far. Did you put together a chart of times and events to aid the jury in understanding your testimony and tracking the dates and times discussed? Yes, I did. Is that what uh, State's Exhibits 31A and 31B are? Yes, it is. Are the, uh, are the dates and times and the uh, individuals listed there, uh, true and accurate representations of what have been testified to so far? Yes. Your Honor, the state would, uh, for demonstrative purposes, ask for the admission of State's Exhibits 31A and 31B. All right. Uh, let's start with 31A. Is there any objection to the admission of that as a demonstrative exhibit? No. 31A will be admitted. And as to 31B, any objection? No. 31B is also admitted as a demonstrative exhibit. May I get, publish those to the jury, Your Honor? You may. Detective, similarly, can you use your pointer and um, Point out what you observe on State's Exhibit 30, 31A. July 11th, 2019 is the day that Charles Vallow dies. September 2nd or 3rd, uh, Lori, Alex, Tylee, and JJ moved to Rexburg, Idaho. Last known proof of life for Tylee Ryan was September 8th, 2019. Last known proof of life for J.J. Vallow was September 22nd, 2019. October 2nd, 2019 was the attempted shooting of Brandon Boudreaux. October 9th, 2019 was the attempted shooting of Tammy Daybell. October 19th, 2019 is the day that Tammy dies. Similarly, Detective, can you point out what you observe on State's Exhibit 31B? 31B is the, the key dates of the investigation we had spoken about earlier. November 1st, 2019 is the day I was contacted by Fremont County. November 4th, 2019 is the day that I seized 
the 2018 Jeep Wrangler. November 5th, 2019 is the date that Chad and Lori were married in Kauai. November 25th, 2019 is the day that I was requested to do a welfare check on JJ Vallo. November 26th, 2019 is the date that I contacted Alex Cox and Chad Daybell outside of that residence. November 27th, 2019 was the date we executed the search warrant at Lori Vallow's residence. <laughs> June 9th, 2020 was the day we executed the search warrant at Chad Daybell's residence. <clears throat> and June 10th is the day we went to the 80 County Coroner's Office. Thank you. Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness be handed state, uh, State's Exhibits 11A through 11G. Detective, do you recognize those exhibits? <clears throat> I do. What do they purport to be? They are the photographs of the pet cemetery and the burial site that we later located, uh, Tylee Ryan. Okay, is this the same area you testified, or is this the same pet cemetery area you testified to earlier today? Yes. Okay. And uh, this is something you saw with your own eyes? Yes. Uh, and you saw this on June 9th and June 10th, 2020? Yes, that's correct. Um, Your Honor, I'd ask that state's exhibits... Uh, uh, one moment, Your Honor. I'd ask the state's exhibits 11A through 11G be entered into evidence. All right. Any objection to any of those exhibits from the defense? If I could have just a second, Judge. You may. No objection. Okay. Uh, just to keep the record clear, exhibits <coughs> states 11A. 11B, 11C, 11D, 11E, 11F, and 11G have all been admitted and may be published. Detective, can you describe what you observed in State's Exhibit 11A? This is the pet cemetery. Uh, as I earlier testified, we knew it was the pet cemetery because of the black dog statue that was next to the post. Detective, uh, can you, with the pointer, point out the black dog? Sorry. Right there. Thank you. <clears throat> also in this photograph is 
the fire pit that is sectioned off that we were also going through and the blue tarps, anything of interest or evidentiary value that we uh, dug out of the ground were placed on the blue tarps. Thank you. Detective, can you describe what you observed in <coughs> State's Exhibit 11B? As I testified earlier, when we began digging down, we could notice the difference in soil uh, from dry soil to a moist soil, and we started to, to get into clumps of, of rotted flesh, charred flesh, um, and, and this is starting to get down into the rotted flesh and the charred flesh. There's a piece of broken charred bone sticking up through the dirt, um, and that's, that's what that photograph is. Detective, can you describe what you observed in State's Exhibit 11C? Sorry, maybe that's the best way. As we began digging down and, and this, the flesh and bone began coming out of the ground, we would, we had our, our rubber gloves on, grab it out of the ground and place it on the blue tarp that I described earlier. Um, this is just a portion of some of the flesh and, and charred bone, broken bone that we had uncovered at that time. Uh, it still has some dirt on the, on the charred flesh, but there's bone fragments, there's some more bone fragments, some bone there, and the rotted charred flesh that was attached to that bone. Detective, what did you observe in State's Exhibit 11D? <clears throat> when I testified earlier about the mass, the, the, the clump of, of flesh and bone that was placed into the melted green bucket, um, that's what you're looking at here. Y you can see the, the part of the plastic green bucket um, there's parts of bone sticking out here. Um, this area here is all uh, burnt flesh, um, fatty tissue. There's organs that weren't completely burnt through all the way. Um, like it was just placed in the bucket and kind of stayed there. So we dug around that bucket the best we could. Uh, we would get in there and, and dig by hand um, with, with paint brushes or anything that we can get. Uh, underneath this bucket, you can start seeing the partial remains of a human skull underneath the, the melted bucket. Detective, how long did this process take you? Hours. Um, like I said, we could only we were only able to get down there on our hands and knees for a couple minutes before we had to uh, have somebody else come relieve us because of the smell. Detective, what did you observe in State's Exhibit 11E? This is a close-up of the partial skull that was under the melted green bucket bucket it was a plat bucket um, and you can see the white lettering there's an L there uh, but the bucket itself was was melted and all that was stuffed inside and uh, underneath there was part of uh, the top of the skull and we also found a jawbone, 
underneath this portion here that isn't depicted in that picture. Detective Wood, did you observe in States Exhibit 11F? After we removed that mass of flesh, um, after it broke into clumps and we tried to pick it up and it, it, it broke up and we had to, by hand, pick everything up and put it onto the tarp, um, that's what was left. It was the moist soil. Um, and so we dug down a little bit more, found some, some teeth. Um, but that is after we took the the teeth and the flesh, everything out of the hole. That's what was left was the moist soil. We dug down further to make sure that we had um, found everything and there was nothing else after that. And Detective, what do you observe in State's Exhibit 11G? This was part of the of Ty Lee that was inside of the bucket that had broken up when we tried to move it onto the mat or onto the tarp. Um, there's bone, charred bone, charred flesh, um, rotting flesh. There's there's part of the top of a skull here. The orbital sockets are there. Um, that's the top of the skull. Um, these are just some of the parts that that we had to get out of the ground and placed onto the tarp. Detective, I believe you testified earlier that on June 10th, you and Detective Ball followed the Fremont County coroner and took these remains to Ada County. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And what did you do with them on <clears throat> June 10th? June 10th, we dropped them off and, and left uh, J.J. and Ty Lee with the 80 County Coroner in their custody. Um, and we agreed to come back the next morning on June 11th to perform the autopsy. Okay. And did you do that? Did you go back on June 11th? We did. Okay. Uh, what was the first thing you did when you got there on June 11th? Initially, we met with the medical examiner, Dr. Garth Warren. Uh, we met in his office. He briefed us with what we were about to go through, um, kind of walked us through what was going to happen. And at that time, uh, he walked us down a hall. We put on uh, booties on our, on our shoes. Uh, we had gloves. Um, we signed in on the whiteboard, everybody that was inside the room. Um, and at that time, uh, Dr. Warren and his team brought out uh, the black body bag that had contained uh, the black plastic bag that we had taken out of the ground that day before. What did you observe next? They cut the seal on the body bag and unzipped the body bag, and it revealed the black plastic bag that had the duct tape. Um, he placed that bag onto the metal table. Um, it still had dirt on it from when we had taken it out of the ground. Um, they took photographs, did whatever they need to do, and... Uh, they cut down the center of the black plastic bag. Okay. 
when they cut down that plastic bag, what did you observe? I saw <clears throat> um, a little boy in red pajamas. Um, he had a white plastic bag around his head, several layers of duct tape from his chin to his forehead area. Uh, his arms were duct tape with several layers of duct tape. His arms were folded like this across his chest. Can you guys see that? Um, his feet were also duct taped and bound. He had a white and blue child's blanket um, placed on top of him. Okay. What did you observe happen next? Uh, Dr. Warren cut open the bag that was wrapped over JJ's head. <clears throat> um, exposing what was underneath. Um, and underneath that white plastic bag, there was another layer of duct tape across his mouth from jawline to jawline. Okay. And then what happened? Uh, he then cut the duct tape away from his arms um, to expose his wrists and, and his forearms. And when he did that, it was also another level, level of duct tape wrapped around his wrists so his wrists were bound this way. Um, yeah. yeah. Did you remain for uh, the entirety of, of J.G. Vallow's autopsy? I did. Um, once that duct tape was removed, uh, what did you observe? Through the videos and pictures that we had seen of JJ for the last eight months, the nonstop looking, the, the tips coming in, the uh, everything we had obtained and looked at, um, I was able to recognize that little same little boy lying on the table to be JJ Vallow. Uh, he had the same haircut. It was short on the sides, long brown hair on the top. Um, so he was, I recognized him as JJ. Okay. Was there anything else that was, uh, that stood out to you during that autopsy? Um, his, his pajamas were soaked with body decomposition. Um, he had, still had on his pull-up nighttime diaper. Um, there was some visible bruising on his arms that the medical examiner had pointed out to us. Um, that's all. Detective, uh, upon the completion of the autopsy of J.J. Vallow, what did you do? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah. Upon the completion of J.J. Vallow's autopsy, uh, what did you do next? Dr. Warren brought in the second uh, set of remains of Tylee. Um, he undid the, the body bag. Once he saw what was inside the body bag, uh, he had advised us that um, there wasn't anything he was going to do that evening that we can come back the next day. Um, and so at that point, we left the coroner's office. Okay. Just one moment, Your Honor.
Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness be uh, handed states, states Exhibit 12A through 12E. A and B? A through E. A through E, thank you. And Detective, if you'll look at those and let me know when you've had a chance to review them. Detective, do you recognize uh, those exhibits? Yes, I do. What do they purport to be? Uh, J.J. Vallow, um, in the condition that we first saw him after they cut open the uh, black plastic bag. So are these photos from the autopsy? They are. Okay. Uh, and you were there the entirety of the autopsy? Yes, sir. And you saw it with your own eyes? Correct. Are those exhibits, uh, exhibits 12A through E, true and accurate representations of what you witnessed that day? Yes. Your Honor, the state moves for admission of exhibits 12A through E. All right. Uh, is there any objection to states A through E, exhibit 12? No, Your Honor. All right. States Exhibit 12A, 12B, 12C, 12D, and 12E are all admitted into evidence and may be published. Detective, what did you observe in State's Exhibit 12A? This is the first time we saw J.J. once they cut down the black plastic bag that revealed what was inside. Uh, that's J.J. with the white plastic on his head. You can see where we originally cut the plastic when he was in the ground to reveal his brown hair. <clears throat> But the level, the the amount of duct tape over his face, uh, over his arms, the body decomposition uh, is kind of what caught our attention. Okay. Uh, is that the blanket? Is the blanket you referred to earlier in that picture? Yes, that's the blue and white child's blanket that was placed on top of him. Okay. Detective, what do you what did you observe in State's Exhibit 12B? That's the the legs of JJ. He's still wearing the sketcher socks. Uh, still has on the red pajama pants, and his ankles are also bound with duct tape. Were you able to observe any decomposi excuse me, decomposition fluid in that area of that that's shown in that picture? Yes, uh, it's hard to see in the picture, but uh, the whole bottom half of his uh, red pajamas were soaked with body decomposition. Thank you. Detective, what did you observe in State's Exhibit 12C? <clears throat> This is after the medical examiner first cut down the white plastic bag. Uh, like I testified earlier, he had a, a strip of duct tape around his mouth from jawline to jawline. Um, as you can see, his, his skin's going through various stages of decomposition. Um, but he was still recognizable with the brown hair and facial features that we had seen in the photographs. Um, for the last eight months.
Detective, what what did you observe in State's Exhibit 12D? That's the white plastic bag that was placed over J.J.'s head. Uh, it appeared to be the waffle-style type expandable trash bag that people normally put in their kitchen. It had a red drawstring. Um, but that's what was over his head. And what you're looking at, uh, uh, there's pieces of duct tape that were attached to that. And and this is just uh, body decomposition that was inside the plastic bag from his face. And what did you observe in States, States Exhibit 12E? <clears throat> That's a picture of JJ um, still with the duct tape around his mouth, just a close-up picture. Um, like I, I testified earlier, you can still see the long brown hair, um, the, the shape of his head. It was very easily to identify that little boy on the table as, as the one we had been looking for for the last eight months. Detective, did you do, after the autopsy of JJ, uh, did you do anything else uh, uh, in Ada County in regards to his remains? <clears throat> I assisted uh, Lieutenant Ron Ball with transporting various items from the autopsy uh, to the Idaho State Lab uh, the next day on June 12th. Okay. Uh, did you do anything further with any of the remains of Tylee Ryan in Ada County? Uh, no. No. One moment, Your Honor. Your Honor, the state has no further questions for Detective Hermosillo at this time. Uh, due to the nature of this case, we may need to recall him at, at other times to continue the nature of the investigation. But for purposes of today, we have no further questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Uh, I'll allow for cross-examination. I realize we took a long lunch break. However, given the uh, evidence just published, I think it would be appropriate to allow a Another break for the jurors just to uh, clear the air for a moment, and then we'll allow for some cross-examination. So we'll try to make this a quick break. I say that, but 15 minutes. Hopefully we'll be back on for cross-examination. We'll be in recess for the jury. All right, please. Thank you. Please be seated.
Yes, thank you. All right, please. All right, thank you. Please be seated. Back on the record, case CR 22-211624, State v. Lori Noreen Vallow. We took a mid-afternoon break. Detective Hermosillo, you are still under oath, I'll remind you. At this time, the defense may be allowed cross-examination. Mr. Thomas, you can inquire. Thank you, Your Honor. How are you doing today? It's been a tough day. It's been a tough day. It's been a long day. So I'm just going to uh, ask a few follow-up questions. I know that uh, the state's had you on all day, and we're hopefully going to get get this done. So uh, you indicate that um, you've been a detective for about four years now. That's correct. So you were on you were in the detective division for about a year when this uh, came down. Uh, under a year. Under a year. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so um, you indicate the first. Uh, opportunity you had to get involved in this case, I believe, was on November the November the first. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, that's when you were contacted by Gilbert PD, right? Uh, no, sir. I was contacted by Fremont County on November first. Oh, Fremont County. When were you contacted by Gilbert? What, what, what were you? Let's yeah. Let's just start there. What happened with uh, Fremont County? Why were you contacted by them? They advised me that there was a Jeep in our jurisdiction, possibly, that was involved with the attempted homicide of Brandon Boudreaux. After Fremont called me, I then contacted Gilbert to get more information. Okay, so that's where it came. Okay, so you were first contacted by Fremont, and then you got in touch with uh, Arizona, Gilbert, Arizona. Is that's all right? correct. Okay, all right. Um, and was that also on November the 1st? Did all that happen, like, in a series of hours or something like that? Correct. Okay. Uh, and then they asked you to uh, seize a Jeep, uh, a gray Jeep, and you indicated that you were uh, having some intermittent surveillance, right? Correct. All right. So tell me a little bit about the intermittent surveillance. How intermittent, I guess, is what I want to know. <clears throat> Throughout uh, November 1st, uh, into, I, I'd say starting November 1st, it was probably 15 hours worth of surveillance off and on. And I guess I'm, I'm asking how, over the course of how many days? Over the course of two 
two weeks probably. Okay. And, and then did you ultimately find the vehicle during that two-week period? I found it on the 4th of November. Okay. And so your 15 hours of intermittent surveillance on Chad and Lori, that was between November 1st and about November 15th. Is that right? Yeah, roughly. Okay. And when you say intermittent surveillance, like what what would you do? Is it kind of like a stakeout type thing, or was it was it different? Were you just driving around? How'd that work out? Yeah, we parked in front of the residence uh, when we didn't have other things going on. Um, took a couple photographs uh, if we could, uh, but basically we were there to give any intel to Gilbert Police in reference to that. Okay, and as far as the surveillance and intel, was that done at um, in? I'm assuming it was in Rexburg because it because you're a Rexburg detective, right? Correct. So you weren't going to uh, Chad's house. You were mostly staying at Lori's house when you were doing that surveillance. Correct. Okay. And about how many times did you come? Did you end up seeing uh, Chad and Lori? Uh, at that particular apartment during that 15 days? We saw them there the very first day, November 1st. Uh, and I don't recall seeing them after that. Okay. Um, when you say about 15 hours over about 15 days, was it about an, an hour a day or was it more different chunks, different times? Probably different chunks, different times, depending okay. on what was going on. All right, thanks. That, that's very helpful. Um, you indicate that the first time that you heard of JJ uh, was when you seized. No, this was this was a little bit confusing for me. You said the first time that you heard of JJ uh, was when the, the jeep was seized on November November the fourth. But then you said on November the 18th, I think, was when you said you, the first time you, you uh, heard about J.J., is that right? The first time we heard of J.J. was November 18th when Gilbert Police came up to seize the infotainment center from the Jeep that we had originally seized on the 4th. Okay. And help me understand, I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a car guy, so what is an infotainment center? It's the, the, has the GPS locations, uh, the, just the, the middle portion of, of, uh, the inside of the Jeep or the radio. Okay. Where you can program your maps. They took that. Gilbert police took that, seized that, and that's the first time that we had heard of JJ. Okay. Um, so is, I hate to use this term. Is it kind of like the black box of the Jeep now, or, or, or is that something that's still like under the seat type thing? Do you know? I can't answer that. You don't know? Okay. All right. But at any rate, they took the infotainment center, right? Correct. Okay. Didn't take anything else out of the Jeep? or Not that I can recall, no. Okay. And they didn't take the Jeep itself? No, sir. When you, um, on November the 26th, you went to 565 Pioneer Road and uh, talked to Alex Cox and Chad Daybell while they were standing outside of the garage, I believe, at uh, 175, is that right? Correct. Um, you indicated, well, I don't know if you did indicate or not, uh, were you wearing a body cam? When you were talking to them? No, sir. So you're, wh who else was with you when you were talking to them? Detective Hope. And was Detective Hope wearing a body cam? No, sir. Were either of you wearing um, some type of audio recording device? No, sir. Okay. So whatever was said, um, that would have been from your recollection, not from anything that you've reviewed, like a, a video or an audio? That's correct. Okay.
So, and, and the reason that you were at uh, Lori's apartment was um, for a welfare check on on JJ. Is that right? On the twenty sixth. Yes, I'm sorry. On the twenty sixth of November, twenty nineteen. Yes, that's correct. All right. And you indicated that you called uh, Lieutenant Ball, Lieutenant Ron Ball, um, who is kind of over you, is that right? That's right. All right. And so um, you thought there was some suspicious activity uh, with regards to your conversation, and then you decided to get a warrant. Uh, so what was, what was the basis of getting the warrant? The basis of the warrant was the actions of Mr. Daybell, Mr. Cox on the 26th, the fact that we were advised that J.J. was with a family friend who later determined that there was, J.J. was never with her, that was a lie, uh, based on... Well, hold on. I apologize for breaking in. But when you said, based on the family friend, that didn't happen when you went to go get the warrant, right? That happened later, right? No, sir. That happened the 26th. That night, we were able to confirm that J.J. was not with Melanie Gibb, and that was not the case. Okay. So, and after that conversation, that was when you were going to go to the prosecutor's office and get the warrant? After the conversation that with Melanie Gibb. Ron Ball and Dave Stubbs had with Lori Vallow, mm-hmm. where she told those detectives that J.J. was at a movie with Melanie Gibb at Frozen 2. Yes. Once we were able to talk to Melanie Gibb, Melanie Gibb says, that is not true, that was a lie. That was not the case. The next morning, we obtained the search warrant. Okay. So, but what you testified on direct exam, and I'm not trying to trip you up, I'm just trying to figure out what, what actually, what the sequence of events was. You talked to Chad, he finally gave up Lori's phone number, you called Lieutenant Ball, thought that it was suspicious, Dave Stubbs arrives, they knock on 175, no answer. All those are correct, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, then you go and knock on 174, which was Melanie Pulowski, Melanie um, Bedro's house, is that right? Correct. No answer? Correct. Okay. And then it says, the next thing I have, and this, this is probably me, says, go, into the prosecu- go to the prosecutor's office to get a warrant. Is that what happened? That's correct. Okay. So this was before anybody called Melanie Gibb and found out that there was... Uh, that, that they weren't at Frozen 2, right? No, sir. Okay. So originally we went to go get the warrant, and if you remember I testified that when we were at the prosecutors to get the warrant, Lori Vallow then called Detective Hope back, and she was advised to open her front door. Then Lori spoke with the detectives, and that's where the body cam with Lieutenant Ball and Dave Stubbs come in where Lori admits that J.J. was with a family friend. But you were already at the prosecutor's office getting the warrant, or attempting to get a warrant, right? That's correct. Okay. And what was the basis? What was the crime that was committed that you needed to get a warrant? We didn't obtain the warrant. I know, but in order to... Okay. So you just went to the prosecutor's office hoping to get a warrant on a hunch? It wasn't a hunch. It was based on uh, the lies that we were being told, uh, the concern that we had for J.J. at that point. What was the crime? Lying to the police about the whereabouts of J.J. And that's what the warrant was going to be based on? We didn't get the warrant, sir. I know you didn't get the warrant, but you said you attempted to get a warrant, or you walked over to get a warrant. I, I can't speculate whether the judge would have given us the warrant or not. Okay. You ended up getting a warrant the next day, is that right? <coughs> That's correct. And you found some guns and some magazines and some other 
paraphernalia. Uh, and when I say paraphernalia, I mean like weaponry, paraphernalia stuff like that. You understand? Correct. Uh, did you at any time during the investigation, was there anything that led you to believe that Lori Vallow or Lori Daybell was involved in having those weapons or owned those weapons? No, sir. Okay. And, and when I say paraphernalia, I mean like the ghillie suit. That that wasn't look that didn't look like something that would fit her, right? I I can't answer that. Okay. You didn't okay. You talked a little bit about um, proof of life, and your definition, according to what I wrote down, and I may be wrong, but what I wrote down was any documentation that would confirm that a person was alive. Is that is that accurate? That's accurate. Okay. Would that be your definition? That's my definition, yes. Okay. Um, and so you indicated that the last proof of life that you got for Tylee was on September the 8th. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Um, isn't it true that you had hundreds of tips that came in with regards to where Tylee and JJ were in the months after this September the 8th? That's true. We had hundreds of tips come in after September the 8th, mm -hmm. none of which were verified to be Tylee. Okay, but you didn't vet every every tip. We right? followed up on every tip. You followed up on every tip. Yes, sir. There was there was never a time where uh, you said, "Oh, wow, we called this number and nobody answered," and so we we just never followed up after that one phone call. That never happened. No, there could have been those times, okay. but we followed up on every tip. That's right. Okay, but you didn't follow it up to the point where you knew that it wasn't true. Um. Correct. Okay. Um, with regards to uh, the death of Tammy Daybell, um, Tammy Daybell died on October the 19th, 2019, as far as you know, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and do you know where Lori Daybell was on... October the 19th, or I'm sorry, at that time she was Lori Vallow. Do you know where Lori Vallow was on October the 19th, 2019? I do. Where was she? Hawaii. Okay. Um, so she wasn't anywhere near Tammy Daybell when Tammy Daybell died? That's correct. When you searched the... Uh, property of Chad Dayville on June the 9th. Um, you said you got there around 7 a.m., is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. And this wasn't something that was like a spur-of-the-moment thing where you got some guys together and all ran out, got a warrant the day before. I mean, this was something that was planned. I guess what I'm saying is this is something that was planned, correct? Correct. For, for weeks, maybe even months? Uh, I wouldn't go that far, probably weeks, maybe. Okay. Um, I mean, long enough to get a backhoe out there and set some stuff up, right? I mean, there was there was some planning involved. Correct. Okay. Uh, and you said you got there around 7 a.m. Uh, I believe you kind of alluded to, but I kind of want to nail it down, uh, that the FBI ERT team, the Evidence Recovery Team, they were kind of the ones running point or the ones in charge of the uh, of the search. Is that right? Once the scene was secure, yes, they were in charge of the search. Okay. So how long did it take to secure the scene? Long enough for us to make contact with Chad and the kids and make sure there were no potential threats inside the residence. So I'm guessing... 20 minutes. Okay. And 
And when you arrived at 7 a.m., there were a bunch of people that arrived at the same time, right? I mean, no, you weren't the no, lone, sir. You were the lone gunman going in? No, nope, there were three of us, three or four of us. Okay. You and who else? Uh, myself, Lieutenant Ron Ball, Detective Vince Kai Kamanu, uh, I think maybe Detective, uh, let's see, David Stubbs was there. I believe that was it. Okay, so the four of you. Um, and where did everybody else stage in preparation to go to the, to, did they, I guess I'm saying, there was a, there were a bunch of people there, probably 30 or 40 people that were involved in this? Correct. Where were they while you guys were securing the scene? They staged at the church in Sugar Salem, on the Sugar Salem Highway. Okay. About two miles away from, just, just down the road, maybe two miles from where Chad Daybell's house is? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, you know, you, you said that you'd only been doing this for less than a year prior to, uh, prior to becoming, or prior to this case coming on. Was this your first time at the scene of a crime like this where you would, where the FBI was in charge and you guys were just kind of worker bees, so to speak? I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to discount your job or what you were doing, but I mean, they were kind of the experts and you guys were kind of the ones that were, uh, were there to help out, right? I've worked with the FBI, Homeland Security, uh, we've served search warrants on different places um, when I was in patrol, even as a patrol supervisor. Oh, okay. Um, when they would come into our jurisdiction, we would assist them, they would assist us. So it's not the first time I've worked with the FBI or, or agencies like that. Mm -hmm. um, to this magnitude, uh, yes, the, that was the first time. Okay. Um, thank you, that was very helpful. And over the last 22 years uh, of you being involved, you know, you mentioned that you'd done this before. Um, about how many times had you done uh, a search where the FBI was involved and you were kind of helping them out? How many times would you say? Probably five or six times. Okay, okay. Um, you, you you mentioned uh, in serving the search warrant that there were a bunch of different agencies involved. You mentioned the FBI, the FBI uh, ERT, or the Evidence Recovery Team, Fremont County, Rexburg Police Department, Idaho Attorney General's Office. I want to say I remember reading something about um, either Boise City Police or, or, or Ada County Sheriff's Office, something like that. Do you remember anybody from them? They weren't there assisting us. They were set up uh, in different locations throughout the the highway in case uh, somebody needed to be followed. Okay, and was that Boise or was that Ada County? Do you remember? I believe I believe it was Boise. Okay, that's what uh, I thought. Their surveillance too, team. I didn't want to. Okay, and they were part of the surveillance team. Correct. Okay. You mentioned. Um, the fact that uh, Chad was out of his home in his car uh, and that he, you had walked up to him and asked him if he needed a coat or a jacket. Is that right? Yes, sir. And you said uh, that you thought that it was uh, peculiar or caught your attention, I guess I should say, that he was looking over his shoulder. Um, and then you said that he was looking in the direction of a tree near the pond area where JJ ended up being found. Is that right? Correct. Okay. But I mean, isn't it true that, I mean, that's a pretty wide view. You could be looking at any number of things, right? He was looking towards the tree pond area. Okay. But you weren't looking at him to see where his eyes were, right? I wasn't looking into you his eyes. Is right. That what you you're weren't asking? looking eye to eye with him. No, I was not looking eye to eye with him. Okay. So you don't necessarily know where he was looking. He was looking towards the pond area under the tree, towards the tree. Okay. 
I guess we'll just agree to disagree. <laughs> um, so your first task, I believe, uh, by the evidence recovery team was that you were to sift through the fire pit. Um, were there a number of agents or a number of officers uh, or detectives that were involved in sifting through the fire pit with you, or were you kind of the lone guy on that on the fire pit area? No, there were a couple other detectives uh, and also uh, members from the ERT team as well, kind of directing us on, on what they needed or what to do. Okay. So... In the fire pit area, I saw I saw that um, there was some pink tape or pink ribbon that was kind of marked out in, in an area in one of the photographs. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And the fire pit area was specifically marked out as a particular area? Correct. How big of an area would you say that that uh, was marked out? Because I didn't have a any type of a ruler. I wasn't there. I don't know. Oh, I'd say... I, I couldn't even guess. Okay. It was it was a a large area. Large area. So when when they took the photograph of the fire pit and you identified it as the fire pit, um, it didn't just encompass that one circle of uh, cinder blocks or the or the wood around it, right? It was a lot more land than that. It was the fire pit area correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and so about how long was it between when you went in and originally secured the scene? You said it was about 20 minutes. And then when did you start working on the fire pit? Uh, I'd, I'd probably say between 8 and 8.30 maybe. Okay. And then I have written down here that, um, the pond area, there was a search from about 9 a.m. observed while sifting through the fire pit. Did that happen around 9 a.m.? You were at the fire pit for about half an hour, I guess is what I'm saying? Roughly. I, I didn't keep track, but I would say roughly half okay. hour-ish. And so then a half hour goes by, and then something else is going on at the pond area, um, and you're taken over there or you're asked to come over there? Correct. Okay. And a number of people stayed at the uh, at the fire pit area, is that right? I, I can't answer that. I was over at the, the pond at that point. Okay. Were you called over by one of the ERTs? I don't remember who I was called over by. Somebody. Somebody. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. <clears throat> um, now, st State's Exhibit 10A, there, there was some talk about... <coughs> excavation of the backyard and that was <coughs> um i believe in some of the photographs that i've seen there was a there was actually a backhoe is that right a large piece of equipment i'm sorry you have to answer audibly <coughs> sorry swallow drum i'm sorry that's correct okay um and <coughs> this backhoe uh were you there when it took the first piece of uh, topsoil off of the uh, off of the ground at the, at the place where JJ was buried. We didn't use the backhoe oh. where JJ was buried. Okay, so the first picture that I saw that was published—I don't know the na number, but it just had all the grassy part, and then there was a small patch that was not as grassy. Right? Correct. You understand that picture? Yes. Okay, and then the next picture that I saw was a place where they had already taken off that top layer of grass. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Okay. And so how did that layer of grass get taken off? With shovels. Okay. And how deep, uh, were you were you involved in digging that first layer off? I did not participate in digging the first layer, no. Did you watch the first layer be taken off? I did. Okay. So, I mean, I, I don't know how, that, how, how it worked out, but did they go in... Uh, like in a, uh, what type of shovel was it? Was it a spade shovel or was it a flat ended uh, shovel? I can't remember, sir. You don't remember. How deep was the first layer? How much was pulled off at first? 
um, roughly an inch, maybe. So very little. Correct. Okay. All right. All right, Mr. Thomas. Yes. Um, apologies for the interruption. Oh wow! I didn't even know I was going to go that long. Well, we're and uh, I don't want to rush your cross examination. I think there will be more for the detective tomorrow in any regards. So okay. I think it would be a good time for us to adjourn for the day. Um, <clears throat> before we do that, as I've told the jurors before, and I will continue to tell you again, and I appreciate your <coughs> attentiveness to this instruction before we break for the day. Please do not talk to anyone about this case, including each other. Please don't do any research or look the case up online or take every effort if you can to please avoid viewing anything about the case in the media that you may run across between now and tomorrow. Uh, you'll be asked to sign that juror affirmation again. We appreciate the effort you've put into this case thus far. And with that admonishing instruction in mind, then we'll see you tomorrow to commence again, uh, scheduled to start at 8.30. So if everyone would please rise for the jury, we'll adjourn for the day. All right, please. Thank you. Please be seated. Council, before we adjourn for the day, I'm going to uh, ask that Council remain in. Uh, I've got an issue to discuss with the Council, which will be in a closed proceeding, so we'll uh, clear the courtroom and uh, turn off the simulcast also to conclude for the day. Before we take that up, is there anything else the state wishes to bring up before we adjourn for the day in the public setting. Nothing from the state. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Anything further from the defense? All right. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a brief five-minute break here to allow the public to clear the courtroom. You can be excused as well, and we'll see you here tomorrow. And we will uh, conduct a hearing that the court determines needs to be closed for reasons I'll state on the record once we call that up.